Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioners, my name is Richard Murcott. I'm uh, the current chair of the Bond and Residence Association, um, representing the association's submission this morning. Um, the, the key issues that we'd like to table for you are uh, listed on the slides. Um, these are strategic topics that are concerning us at this moment. Um, I'd also like to declare that the association uh, declares its full support for submissions by Live Wellington. Historic Places Wellington, Wellington Character Charitable Trust, and numerous other PDP submitters per the association's further submission. Um, as Wellingtonians, you'll, you'll appreciate um, a particular view, uh, a little bit of scene setting. Um, the association um, residents hold considerable passion for the suburb and for the city, and they care very much about the city's growth. And its prosperity <clears throat> greatly values the distinctive character of the suburbs, pre 1930s residences, and the heritage and stories of this place. It's uh, it's got a lot of distinctive characteristics. In fact, in that particular picture there, uh, that little point into the harbour was actually built because of um, the loss of many hundreds of houses from Thornton construction of the motorway. Stepping back more than a dozen years, Offa Miskell uh, supported the Wellington District Council and uh, internal policy reports and to the uh, Policy and Strategy Committee dating back to uh, 2010 highlighted the special characteristics of, um, of the suburb. And we've learned as residents over the last decade uh, a lot about our place and the need to plan for resilience. And we have a very comprehensive community plan for dealing with vulnerabilities in our community. And this, we think, is very significant, the points we're going to raise with you. I'd like to start with uh, population projections. Uh, constantly, we are, um, we are, like right now, we're in the midst of a conversation about changing the layouts of our streets in the city. and. Lots of material that come to, comes to us from, this, from the council continuously push that we have uh, to grow by up to 80,000 people over the next 30 years. And uh, of course, that's, that's reflected in the proposed district plan. We, the association, uh, presents our experts' projection. Our expert is the government statistician. These projections frame things significantly differently from the assertions that were made for the spatial plan. Uh, the estimates then and now for the PDP and the transport strategy appear inflated to us. The association observes somewhat alarmingly that Stats New Zealand's low projections for the city in 30 years time is the risk of a significant population decrease. It could even be as much as 7,000 less than 2018 and 2048. The association members ponder how much of this conditioning, the repetitive use of overly inflated statistics, may have influenced responses and decision making on the proposed district plan. The population projection differences are significant and it has the effect of potentially undermining the overall trustworthiness of the planning process, particularly when, as a consequence, the plan suggests a need to sacrifice significant things that are highly valued, such as in a suburb like Thornton. Things like uh, inner city character and character uh, heritage areas to accommodate an inflated population guesstimate. To the association, this is significant, as the PDP has identified no character precincts on its southern and eastern flank. That's next to the city zone. Indeed, it's e the city zones even encroached onto the current residential areas. And please note that the sacrifice of character and heritage is inconsistent with the Boffer Miskell reports, and thus some of those go back to 2008-2009, not just the more recent ones you're familiar with. Through you, Mr Chair, or the entire panel of commissioners, 
The association would like to ask of the council why the PDB population projections were inflated up to 80,000. And then what should the PDP look like if Stats New Zealand's low population projection uh, projections for 2033 being a 10-year planning horizon or 2048, the 30-year horizon, were to prevail? The second um, matter we'd like to table is uh, the question of qualifying matters. Um, the association, association questions the absence of the utilisation of qualifying matters provisions uh, to exclude areas with vulnerability uh, to natural disaster in particular. The association feels that the council can and could and perhaps should have used things like vulnerability to flooding or the absence of significant infrastructure or sufficient infrastructure as a qualifying matter. <clears throat> we have evidence as residents um, and long memories of the challenges we face. Professor James Renwick of Victoria University of Wellington, when talking about uh, the wetter storms that uh, we now experience, you know, atmospheric rivers and things like that, he said, we're sailing into uncharted waters. The association translates, translates this to mean that the inundation map in the PDP needs a significant overhaul and then the physical infrastructure to deal with this reality. And even if we go and look at reports from places like Wellington Water, um, we don't want to delve into the detail, but just there are extra costs involved in, in building in this um, vulnerable place. And lastly, uh, we just have some thoughts about um, impacting housing of affordability, uh, that sort of strategic objective of the PDP. Um, the association, as a strategic matter, the association has concerns about the ability of the PDP to significantly influence housing affordability in the city. Of course, it's at the beginning of the process, but constantly we, we know that it's actually expensive, very expensive to build. We don't know how the uh, PDP influences that. And some association members are confronting extraordinary additional uh, corporate body levies in order to deal with building maintenance. Um, and body corporates are increasingly discovering that large multi-unit buildings can be very expensive to maintain. These affordability issues and many other factors seem to be beyond the scope of the PDP after the designation to Lancaster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Merkel. Um, very helpful. Um, just kicking off, you said you were relying on uh, uh, said stats predictions and um, saying what's the council doing? And the council called a statistician for sense projections who talked us through, in fact, he like he was very open that they are more bullish than about four population predictions than NZ stats. And so I think the, the answer to your rhetorical question is what's this council relying on? The answer is that they're relying on uh, uh, sense projections. Um, but the more pressing thing to me is that um, I asked the Council 42A authors, how sensitive is their response to the population predictions? If the population predictions were lower, would anything change? I didn't quite, I didn't put it like that, but that was the thrust of the question. And the answer was that it's actually academic because by the time uh, you comply with the mandatory directions of the uh, NPSUD, uh, you've got enough houses for the sense population predictions. <laughs> Put another way, uh, even if you didn't have those population predictions, you would still have the mandatory direction for uh, medium density throughout the city and 
high density within walking distance of the city centre. So that's not really a question, and it's an observation that that's the message we're getting from the council. And so I'd invite you, if you have any comment, that overlay that because you put on the table some projections and message we're getting from council well, it doesn't actually matter. It's academic. Because that's the direction of the NPSUD that we are bound to give effect to. Could I could I add? Um, I'm not, I haven't got an immediate response to that, Mr. Chair. I would like to add, just going back to the infrastructure issue that behalf of the association. Whether you or the entire panel of commissioners would like to ask of the council why a qualifying matter is not applied for stormwater, uh, stormwater runoff uh, in this um, flood prone area of Thorndon. Okay, wasn't this isolated as an opportunity to limit the development of the Thorndon flat? We asked that question and the answer we got was that it's done another way through the over um, through the requirement to meet Wellington water standards three waters as a condition of the uh, permitted activity standard so as a permitted activity standard well we experienced the reality. We experienced the uh, the problems of the infrastructure failing all around us, and you you can see the videos of a, a stream daylighting itself right through the Thorndon flat. It's part of um, material we'll present in more detail when we get to that stream. But we did provide it in the stack that we we, we provided this morning. You can you can see this stuff. You can see the water running off streets into houses. Those photographs were taken some while ago, some of them two decades ago. So now what we're facing, the reality of our climate change, it's here now. Uh, we've got um, some serious issues to plan for. And um, I, I'm not a bureaucrat. I'm not, um, I don't know how to respond to these sorts of assertions coming back from the bureaucracy, from the corporation. I'm just pre presenting on behalf of the association, our members, what we know about the vulnerabilities in our, in our place and how we have to deal with them. We also know the history of the place. We know the geology of the place. We know where the uh, filled in gullies are and things like that. In fact, we know it better than the PDP because it's mapped some of these incorrectly, but you don't get to those sorts of corrections until later in the hearing process. So we bring all this, these sorts of real world things to you and we do it well from a, a point of serious knowledge of place. We have residents who, who are still living in houses that were built in by, by their families, like in 1914 for example. We've got long memory, lots of understanding of the way the suburb works. And we saw, I, I guess my response to some extent is all of that understanding of place. <laughs> isn't reflected in the plan properly, and particularly the way that the, the plan suggests that the city needs to encroach even further, really, and take over highly valued areas of residential, really? Notwithstanding the reply, uh, Mr. Chairman, concerning the, the, the corporation's response, it's just, we've got, it's a question of balance. This, this city has got certain characteristics. It's got certain. It's got a profile that's well known internationally. And it's, it's part of our economy. It's, it's part of the whole story of the place. And, you know, you, you just can't take sort of an Auckland situation or a Christchurch example. And so it's, you know, just like that here. It's not. We've got very special um, assets. And, and things that, that attract people to come to Wellington. We don't want to um, throw the baby out in the bathwater. Well, we're trying to intensify the city, 
to we need to do we need prosperity that comes and follows all this but let's do it in a way that that gets the balance right and understand where we where we where we're doing this intensification and particularly in this suburb we're at the nexus of all the lifelines into the city we're where all the key infrastructure per the lifeline study that's been done and so on comes through this place when this population needs to exit the city they do it through Thorndon. when the population needs to come to, to the city to rescue us they do it through Thorndon. there's a real question of do you intensify the city at this place where all five schools five major schools are and all the other infrastructure in terms of kindergartens and child care centers and goodness knows what that all about supporting the, the way the city works and it's it's there in Thorndon. Just ask my colleagues if they have any questions. Uh, good morning, Mr. Murko. I can certainly sense your frustration coming through loud and clear. Rightly or wrongly, there's a national model that's been established in this council as a requirement to, to give effect to it. But as you have pointed out, there are some qualifying matters under which they can depart from that. You've you've raised a couple um, flooding hazards and the absence of infrastructure. There's been a discussion on those already. The other one that you've raised is um, character areas. You've referred to the Boffer Miskell report and other submitters, particularly the Mount uh, Victoria Residents Association, have also referred to that uh, that report. Um, I th think what I wrote down was that um, you said that. There were no character areas on the southern, was it the southern and eastern flanks of the central city? On the southern side of the motorway in yeah. London, all our residential areas have been not offered any character precinct. Yes. The only character precinct in the proposal is on the western side of the motorway. Okay. We've got significant quality character residents residential areas they were recognized specifically in the boffer missile cut their teeth on this in 2008 yes. 2009 they defined those areas specifically back then yes the the more the latter boffer missile report 2018-19 um well. is there any um commonality or any divergence between the areas uh and the thornton um locale that they differ between the two reports, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. The 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 uh, Rick, the the, the um, in, in the spatial plan debate, there was a little bit of toing and froing about whether character precincts should be over the the Hobson precinct, the Hobson area. Yes. Um, but they had already decided, for whatever reason, the Selwyn precinct and and the Portland Crescent precinct was out of question. That the city the city centre zone would take it over. Okay. It was like it was always up for debate. But that's inconsistent with the bottom of school. Yes. And, and, and others who appreciate the makeup of Thornton. We've got this chasm going through the middle of the suburb. It's really, look, there are visual connections at least between the, the two parts. It's, a, it's, a, it's part of that effect you have with the background of Jiai and Nairangi Hill. It's all part of the look and feel of this part of the city. Yeah. The reason I asked you that question was. As the chair explained to you, the flooding and infrastructure matters are, are not have not been identified as qualifying matters because they've been dealt with in an alternative manner through permitted activity standards on hazard and subdivision. It's another way of achieving the same outcome. The, the character areas could qualify under the discretionary criteria that uh, are listed in the Act. And I'm just wondering, is that, is that, your, is that the position of the association that the character areas as shown in the Boffer Miskell report should be qualifying matters for the purpose of this plan. Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, we would uh, we did have a little bit of debate about some of them. We we feel that some of Boffer Miskell was a little bit shy 
to add some properties into their definition. Um, I mean, they're very much focused on what's actually right on the street front. Yes. And the fact you have a wide driveway and a beautiful looking character house sitting right at you didn't seem to qualify. No, it does that, if you're a pedestrian. Yes, but the, the association is not bringing forward evidence to challenge the Boffin School report, is it? No, we, we support it. Yes. 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 Regardless also, of where you think it's um, not aggressive enough or too aggressive. Our submission covers all of this in detail. We've produced a complete catalogue yes. of properties and photographs a lot. Yes. I'd like to say just some concerns of dealing with those infrastructure issues. We've heard about developments happening in other suburbs, putting in special detention tanks and things like that. That's the kind of what, that's the way you designed a city, you know, 100 years ago or even earlier. In fact, um, you know, the old uh, house and court, horse and cart strips for collecting waste from properties you know, sometimes feature in our subdivision for land pattern, the cadaster. Um, that's not an efficient, reticulation is the efficient way to build a, build a city and make sure that that is existing and you connect to that. Otherwise, if there was a popular use of that, those, those specific techniques, that would be really inefficient. What really ineffective way to go ahead. How does that set us up for the future as, a, as an efficient city? Yeah, well, the two terms that you've used, efficiency and effectiveness, are are two of the criteria that we need to consider in looking at alternative ways to giving effect to those matters, whether whether it's qualifying matters or whether it's through performance standards. So you've raised it, it's on the table. But thank you for that. Thank you, Thank you. Just, um, you refer to the population projections and things like that. One response we've had so far is that it's not necessarily a question of trying the demand is providing sufficient opportunities for the, for the city to respond to whatever construction um, housing demand there is. So it's kind of enabling demand. So if, it, if it's less than 80 or less than 50 or whatever, that the market will respond to that in terms of demand. Do you have any views yes, on yes, that? No, well, we have to enable, we have to enable intensification of our city. We have to do this. But we have to be careful about where we do it so we get the balance right. Um, you know, I, I, we, we'll probably get this into this in other streams, but you know, the, some of the best residences are the ones that are built now with, with timber that's more than 100 years old, with all the carbon that's you know already existing in them. What happens if uh, to all of that if you uh, end up having a laissez-faire approach to um, demolishing them and replacing them with concrete, glass and or steel. Um, I think there's some carbon accounting to be done there as well, let alone the impact on the look and feel of our place and the things that are very valuable to this particular city. So, um, I, I know it's a complex, a very complex mix. Um, intensification, we need the population. Yes, we need to we need to have the flexibility, but I think we're going to have to be very agile going forward. Very smart about it. And I'm not too sure whether just opening up things to be a little bit too free uh, without an, without sufficient opportunity for community, hence resource consent process and so on, to um, to to have a say when um, some of these things happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Merkel. We appreciate you coming to uh, talk to us, and we'll look. For, some of us will look forward to seeing you in stream two. You might see me again in stream one. Well, <laughs> I'm representing the Thorn and Rebs uh, Residence Association this morning. Oh, not but me. you do have a personal submission. Yes, you I have a personal submission. submission. Well, I we'll look forward to seeing you when you arrive personally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We have here that you see representatives. Yeah. I'm submitting submissions. So, do you remember Taco Rinoa? I'm a part of the planner, Heritage Year and Project Honor, and the organization has asked me to. 
give some evidence. Um, the scope of my statement is very, very free. Um, and it's just limited to the submission points of Heritage New Zealand, which I believe were addressed in the third stream. Um, I expect I'll be called to give evidence more, particularly in the uh, Heritage stream, uh, because you're in three, um, and probably in other hearings as well. Um, and I was debating whether I, I just should table this, but it's very brief, but I thought at least there's the opportunity for questions if there are any. Um, it's really just two points within it. So, uh, um, and I, I am interested in the Waitapu Waitukuna definition. I'm interested in what Ngāti Toa Rangatira may bring. I think it's later today. So, obviously, we're going to be hearing it from when we kind of talk around after lunch. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Rand. Um, she wants to any questions, Mr. Rand? Good morning, Mr. Raymond. Good to see you again. Um, in person. <laughs> well, in person in Plymouth. Yes. My question doesn't relate to your summary statement. It relates to what's not in it. And by, by that I'm, um, I mean, given the absence of any material in relation to the strategic objectives relating to heritage, can we take it that New Zealand heritage is in support of those objectives? Um, yeah, that's that is correct. Uh, there was, um, if there had been concern with how those were drafted, there. Yes. Yes. Um, that's a critical question. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because those objectives um, become very important in a top-down approach in terms in terms of fl providing a, um, a a direction for the lower order objectives to give effect to. So you understand that. You, yeah. Thank you. Any more for any more? Well, I didn't have any questions, Mr. Raymond. So I understood exactly what you were saying. In there. That's that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, at least I didn't have to travel far to get here. So, <laughs> well, yes. so what's the uh, what's the ETA on our trip counts? Um, I think about October. Um, we're just doing roofing and um, some other work while there, while they've got the roof exposed. You satisfied my curiosity now. Yes, yes. So I'm looking looking forward to people getting back in there. Absolutely. So thank you for taking the time to come and see us. Uh, we appre uh, appreciate you not assuming that we would have nothing to talk to you about, but uh, that, that uh, Christian McLeod's hot car fast and on will be promoted. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad I didn't take too much of your valuable time. Okay, it's not a problem. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll be seeing we'll you. to see you, particularly in stream three. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have uh, the Macintosh. You might just be in the bathroom. Oh,
Oh, right. Okay. There's no problems. What should I call when I find them? What's on by me? If you're ready to go, we are ready to hear from you. Okay. I'm told to hand out a copy of what I'm saying. That would be appreciated. Can I switch it, please? Please proceed. Thank you. So I am a member of the Ella Kelvin Neighbourhood Group. Um, my name is Rosalind McIntosh, and uh, we have made all possible submissions in recent uh, plans for Wellington, the latest being numbers 356 and FS123. Uh, the group is supported by 90 residents. I also am the owner of a house in Lower Kelvin, which was built before 1890 and which members of my family have called home for the last eight, uh, 90 years. Um, to ask us to tell you what we want and why we want it. What we want is for everybody, everyone, to ring a YWAC a place where each person feels empowered and connected, a stable home from which to grow sustaining roots in both community and the land. Too many Wellingtontonians in our view have had little hope of living in stable homes for far too long. We want tangible, secure places for each of us where we and our children are nourished and taught by our special mountain, waters and sky, soil, plants, birds and creatures. From such strong roots, citizens become kaitiaki, protecting and developing, life-giving riches of the city for those who come after. Our citizens are inspired by the rich history of our city and its sighting, its diverse struggles, strengths and injustices to take positive action for everyone. So the proposed um, district plan seeks to remedy this housing shortage but it does so in a needlessly destructive way. And as a note, I'd like to say that our submissions use many points to support our main request, which is that further careful planning is needed to find more suitable locations, the most suitable locations for high rise intensifications outside the CBD. Council has analyzed all the submissions by isolating points each seemingly insufficient to be allowed, and we hope that this commission will take a holistic view of all the arguments which mutually support each other to yield strong cases for changes to the PDP. In the section 32 evaluation report, it is asked repeatedly, are there unjustified high costs of the regulatory impact imposed on individuals and the wider community? We say yes. Dollars cannot compensate for the proposed unnecessary bulldozing of houses in which we have worked to create homes or the needless 
downgrading of our living conditions through loss of sunlight and privacy. Thus, we can guess C2O2 page 9 that says that the social well being of current residents is supported. Intensification is delivered in a manner that meets the needs of current generations and characteristics important to city identity are protected. I will also contest UFD 03, page 37, that says medium to high density areas are located in areas that are connected to transport networks. And UFD 07, page 38, development that supports a reduction in carbon emissions is enabled. Why do we contest these points? We understand that approximately only one sixth to one seventh of the inner suburban areas newly designated to, to allow without consent demolition and new high rise residential blocks are actually needed to house various projected population increases in Wellington until 2051. Further, we understand that the recent HBA report found that the old plan already met the demand for apartments until 2051 without the need for allocation of large additional areas for this purpose. Our current plan fails to recognize this fact. It seems that the expansion of how in housing needed can largely be accommodated by high rise buildings in underutilized areas and low rise additional housing added to current properties. Then why are six out of seven current residents in inner cities needlessly being threatened with unnecessary and corrosive long term uncertainty about their neighbors neighborhoods continuity? And by a downgrading of their houses by randomly placed unnotified high rise blocks, causing dampness and loss of privacy, sunlight, shade, and food plantings when their connection to landscape and sky is blocked. The PDP overall strategy fails to adequately restrain this potential for neighborhood destruction by not being specific about the areas most suitable for high rise apartments. The very landscape of unsuitable steep valleys and fault lines of the city, new high rise housing areas should be staged, beginning with those that are easily transport accessible and underutilized flatter areas. The removing of demolition controls on old, old neighborhoods must be delayed to a later stage, and only a future demand can be shown to warrant this. Council must acknowledge the need for less suburban high rise buildings than zone and reduce the areas designated for them while increasing the number of character areas as we as we represent in stream two hearings. Do you hope to listen to me? Yes. <laughs> Furthermore, without communities such as Lower Kelvin, Thorndon, sorry. Within communities such as Lower Kelvin, Thorndon, Mount Victoria, Newtown, and Arrow Valley, there are specific sites that are entirely appropriate for tall buildings. Some are already identified by neighbourhood groups. Wellington has wonderful steep hills and valleys that demand that any development be appropriate to the landscape, specific landscape. We know our landscape, we live there, while not needlessly threatening, threatening other established. Residents. Let us therefore learn from history. In 1840, Wakefield, Dubai, had devised in London a laughable, a disastrous plan on an expensive grid for the city of Wellington, which he called Britannia. The plan grossly ignored the people and natural environment already there. It ignored both the rugged topography we love in our current city. And it did disastrously the first settlers, the floodplains of the Hutt River. The district plan needs to take heed of such history lessons where real broad scope plans run into real trouble for a lot of people and not picking the places which are appropriate top topographically and in supporting the residents or people who already live there and know their place. With regard to walkable dist uh, walking distance boundaries, 
Um, we have already submitted these also need to accommodate Wellington's varied terrain. On flat pavements, the elderly, less physically abled, pregnant women, families with children and those with bad backs and so on, might be prepared to walk longer to transport than the average walker's 10, minute, 10 minutes. On slopes, it makes sense that only the uphill, more challenging journey should be used for calculating time. However, on very steep slopes, such as Bolton Street and the Aurora Terrace in Lower Kelvin, which are also exposed to wind and rain and on highway motorway bridges, very rarely do I see a resident willing to walk uphill. All residents here need cars for transport. Intensification will greatly increase the number of cars in these narrow, very steep areas, defeating the purpose of walkable intensification. Another point from our group, relaxing height restrictions in Wellington City. The lauded beauty of the siting of Wellington City has long been protected by building heights, heights being in proportion to our surrounding mountains. Every time I fly in, every time I come down the Nauranga Gorge and come out and see Wellington, I say, ah, how beautiful, aren't I lucky to be here? This must not be marred by relaxing maximum heights in exchange for donations by owners to the city. In reverse, we suggest such donations be required for new buildings to be allowed to be built to maximum heights. In response to Council Section 42A report, we make the following corrections. Our group does not say, as stated in paragraph 441, page 112, that housing used for other than long term is to blame for housing prices unavailability, uh, and unavailability. We do say that in the expensive inner city suburbs, no residence will be built that can be bought by those on moderate incomes. So the needless demolition of our current neighbourhoods will not help the residential housing shortage. We object to our homes being downgraded to advance only the finances of developers and already wealthy housing speculators. We do not say in paragraph 104, page 30, that we do not support the citywide intensification. We do say that sites for high rise intensification need to be much more carefully selected to suit the topo topography as already stated. The rest of what I had to say um, are points, other points, uh, just reiterating other points on our submission. I could stop if you want me to. Well, just uh, why don't you keep going? We've got a, we made up a little bit of time, so we've got time Thank to spare. You. We iterate it as in paragraph 104, page 28 of the Council's uh, section 42A report, um, that random placing of high rise buildings causing loss of sunshine and privacy never, never negatively affects viability of current housing and lived experience. So these issues need to be a qualifying matter. New Zealand is a rare place in the world where we can provide our citizens with sunshine and a little privacy through careful planning. Similarly, we say building tall blocks near character houses needs to be a qualifying matter to avoid depopulation of these character houses. If we can do this, let's do it. It's such a, it's why I came back to New Zealand after multiple times overseas, um, learning and increasing my career um, prospects. That's why I came back to Wellington and didn't stay in other cities in the world. We iterate as in paragraph uh, 395 page 107 that underutilized land can be used first for high density residential use while specifically topologically suitable sites are being identified for high buildings and other areas only as needed at a later stage. We restate as in paragraph 423 page 110 that demolition of older houses releases um, CO2 um, that's in blocked and embedded in them. We also say that because demolition um, uh, causes landfall problems and it adds to the high emissions from new replacement construction happening, it is therefore to be avoided wherever possible. 
this would, would contribute to the RMA objective in Section 32 1A of using the most appropriate way for sustainable management of resources. We restate, as in paragraph 46, page 117, that well facilitated and informed local planning by community needs to occur where this, there is contention. It has been shown to work well for producing agreed, desirable intensification without community dissension and division, which causes long delays for cases and so on. Seattle is an example, Newtown and Thorndon are set us on the right path and, and taking positive steps in this direction. In stream two, we will contest NE01, NE03, and CC03 that seek protection and integration of natural areas into the urban design, and we will contest if that is happening in our area specifically, and we will address new shafts and we reiterate the need for increased character housing in the suburbs. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, can I ask you an opening question? Uh, you said you Dr. live in an old house built before 1990. Uh, what, uh, whereabouts is it? Sorry? Where, where do you, uh, what's, the, what's the address or what's the street? Don't you uh, Wesley Road. Wesley Road. townhouse and um and secondly by um i think i will probably guess on the answer to this question but what do you call lower calvert uh it's that um it's bounded by the botanic gardens um uh, and uh anderson park uh, um the motorway uh, and stretches over to the line of the cable card going up. Um, so that's in terms of the people you're representing. It's people I'm representing, or people who have uh, are supporting uh, these ideas are coming from that. Oh. Uh, some a couple from three or four from outside as well. Thank you. I'll just uh, ask. Uh, so start. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, you keep going. So you're going to start the other one. Hey, I'm sure Lindsay will get over it. Oh, he was really on the button. Just go. Like a quiz just, game. Just go. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we've heard from a um, number of other residents, say from New, both in Newtown and in Oriental Bay, and they're commenting on the the distance of the, the walking catchments changing. Well, it is proposed in the district plan from 10 minutes to 15 minutes. And that it, that that it also and, and that that the, the concerns are that it's un, unrealistic and to to say that you can actually walk you can walk 15 minutes to the edge of the city centre but actually not to anything that is really meaningful or our slopes affect that. Is that something you've had you mentioned that? But it, well, I'm being specific, the steepness of the streets. I mean, they're within the, I think it's uh, within the first 15 steep steepest streets of Wellington, and they're long. Um, Aurora Terrace and yes, um, uh, and also San Sebastian has road has a very steep bit in it and uh, um, Everton Terrace as well. Yeah, they're very steep. Paper. But they, the two streets I know best are very steep and uh, I just people just don't can't walk up them and if the weather's bad, which is often, and the wind's blowing, it's really very really difficult. So if you have problems with your body uh, or you have children with you. Or it's it, or you're carrying something. You need a car, and that's that's what everybody has to in order to get there. It's more than just walking on the flat for ten minutes or fifteen minutes. Mm. With we're, um, with some elderly people, would be happy to do that if they were getting to where they were going in fifteen minutes. But up a steep hill like that, you don't even start. Yes, because the, the 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 fifteen minute extends some way into Lower Kelvin. Isn't it? Uh, if you were going straight uphill, but you don't choose to do that because it's too hard. No. So you you, you are you would, are you saying that you would support the ten minute walking catch on on the flat? Yes, for all those people. I can actually tell. From but an point. exception needs to be made for the, to, the topology. Uh, you know, you 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 intensify that very narrow, steep streets. You've got lots of cars up there, or needing parking, and nobody can, um, walking. It's just a uh, just a way that, that the idea of a flat plan, like in Britannia, 
just doesn't work on our typology. Yes. It's work within the topology. That's all, that's all straight through there, isn't it? And this is yeah. the job of council, it seems yeah. to me. You know, you keep pointing to the national plan. Well, it's the job of council to adapt that mm -hmm. to the local topology, to the needs of a local community, mm -hmm. to, to fulfil the national plan as far as possible, but do it in a way that is sensitive, careful, and yeah, is yeah, aware but, um, of the consequences. Because it's not just you make that ruling and it'll happen. Other things happen because of it, and uh, the future is not what you were expecting. The council did, the expert did factor in topography into that, but we are hearing anecdotal evidence that, that this is not quite the case. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It's not my um, observation and experience, I'm not that I live in the area. Mm -hmm. They will be 15 minutes and I'll get uh, home again from where they are. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Lindsay. Um, Thank you very much for your submissions. And, and I, my first question was was similar to the chairs. Where, what is your area of interest? So it does include Talavera Terrace, Everton Terrace, those parts, because the map in your submission very much concentrated on the Weasley Aurora. Yes, because that's in that, that area I know best and mm. what I had time to research. And uh, so I was quite uh, focusing on the Weasley Road area in, uh, in the that, that comes in stream too. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, my other question was was in relation to your your final comment, and we say in stream two you'll contest three strategic objectives. This hearing is about strategic objectives, um, and um, I wondered what changes you wanted to um, to those three particular objectives. Protection of the natural areas or yes. integration into them. Well, that's exactly. Did, the, did, did did you think about some wording changes to those? Uh, no, it's just that I don't think that the plan is um, uh, uh, honouring that. Okay. It, yeah, and yeah. I will point that out with respect to what I know in my area when in stream two. Yes, but if if you wanted some changes to those strategic objectives, mm. this this is now the time to tell us about what changes you prefer. Right. Rather, um, rather than necessary. Specific application to our area that I'm that I can talk about there. Uh, we do have a wonderful integration of native uh, and other uh, trees, plants, etc. If you walk there, you'll see them and enjoy them as everybody does. Um, and that needs protection. In, in, but I don't know about the whole of the city how that's working. Okay. Yeah, I. I, I understand what you're saying, but really we, we would like to deal with these very high level strategic objectives during this hearing, because like, for example, I, I'm not on. Protection and integration of nat natural areas should be uh, made into, in, into the design with the urban areas, should be in the design. We agree with that, but we don't agree with the way the um, zoning of our area, which has that, uh, will affect that the natural contents. Yeah, I, I guess the main point is we each of the we've got eight commissioners on this hearing and then we split. Now I'm not involved in residential, but I am involved in later chapters to deal with natural environment, for example. And I just was really interested in saying you're going to contest these strategic objectives at a later hearing when, when I think now's the time to do it. And wondered whether well, you'd formulated alternative that, wording. We utterly agree with that integration of urban and nat and the um, natural um, environment. And uh, we don't think that this district plan is in, in our area and possibly in other specific areas. Again, it's this topology thing is actually being on it. Yeah, no, I, I understand the point. Um, but yes, we, 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 we certainly hope to, hoping to have some discussions about the strategic objectives at the end of this hearing. And then, and then, and then the other hearings flow out of that as well. So, so it's adaptation to the topology of specific places, listening to the people who are asking for it, and adapting to it. Okay. Be concerned about does that help? Oh, that that, that helps. I certainly understand your point, but in terms of wording changes to those strategic objectives, no, I'm not just the application. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. That's clear. Thank you very much. Um, 
Good morning. Um, I wondered if you could just tell the panel a little bit about the Lower Kelburn Neighbourhood Group and when it was formed and how many members it has and what your what your um, divine mission is. Divine mission? Uh, <laughs> I, I was wanting to um, hear how the people in the area were responding to the district plan, so I um, put um, things on people's left boxes, knocked on people's doors, and found that most of them had no idea that it was going on or that it would affect them. And these are the people who uh, by email agreed to uh, submissions that I sent them, earlier submissions that I sent them, and um, were happy to um, support what right. I was saying. Um, uh, John Solary, so Solary and Pierre, I've forgotten his last name, who lived just down the street. I speak to John regularly and he too has he has, I have a group of about 60 there, and he has a group of about 30 um, that support this. So had, uh, when, when, when they learned about it, were concerned. Right. So the group really came, was formed in response to the district plan notification? Uh, yes, that's right. It didn't and exist prior to that? Yeah, most of them had, had no idea that many, or that it would affect them or anything. So. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, just one question from me. Um, last last week in our hearings, we heard some very um, impassionate pleas from particularly the youth voice, yeah. um, Generation Zero, um, other um, submitters who um, felt disenfranchised from the ability to live in place. To, to be able to live within the city, um, the central city. Um, you make a comment in your um, response about, you know, uh, making sure that we don't relax um, height restrictions and that, um, and here you say, we, we say that in expensive inner city suburbs, no residence will be built that can be bought by those on moderate incomes. Um, isn't that a concern in and of itself that people who are not so um, privileged, I will use the word privileged, as a, as a, that they don't have the means to live in place, that we're not enabling that to happen? Is that not a concern? Uh, yes, that is a, a great concern. And again, um, that's the, the way the market works. The um, I, for example, live in the go uh, government superannuation and take student boarders. I always have four or more people in my house that are students. Um, uh, I live on a very low income uh, for various reasons, which I can explain, but I'm not here. Um, uh, and the value of my property uh, just goes up and up and up, but it's a paper value. It's my home. I get most of my food out of my garden. I have my community there, my, I, you know, this. so I, I don't want to sell, uh, but I would like that it's, it's very important that, that young people have a place they can call their own and can raise families if they want to. I mean, if we're worried about the falling birth rate in some areas of the community, this is a problem. How, how do we have homes where children can be reared? There are places where high rise can be built, which people can afford. Let's use them and let's you know, but I can't change the fact that the value of my property, I wish I could, keeps going up and up. Um, and I, I'm very concerned about it because I volunteer in four areas of Wellington and I see the pain on, uh, of, of, of volunteer with children. I see the pain of that uh, instability and something needs to happen. But let's do it in a way that um, doesn't create more problems because of our topology and doesn't just disenfranchise one group to enfranchise another we can we have the capacity the council has the capacity to do this for everybody let's let's move that way if i can think of better solutions than the ones i've uh, put forward i'd love to think of them and i'd love to hear from people if they see better solutions where we enfranchise everybody huh? thank you thank you very much Macintosh. we really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us and uh, Good 
Mr. Sampson. Uh, hello, hello, uh, Mr. Sampson, you out there? Uh, yes, I was just waiting for somebody to perhaps suggest I start. So <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, here. Uh, yes, uh, we hear you. We see you. Right. Um, we have your uh, speaking notes. Um, so we're um, interested in how you propose to proceed. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I just um, I will screen share some slides with you. Um, I think that's probably the most useful way to um, proceed. Um, yep. If I just um, can you see that on screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Great. Um, uh, I'm not sure. So I'll just begin by introducing myself and um, uh, um, and good morning from Melbourne in Australia. Um, just a little bit about myself. This is a personal submission, but I do have an extensive background and work on emissions, transport and cities um, and urban issues generally, including transport and emission reductions from the 1990s through to about 2008, when it would be fair to say for an extended period of time, there was less government policy interested in this. And I'm currently the CEO of what's called the Climate and Health Alliance in Australia. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk with you about is what I would call greenhouse gases density and planning. And uh, although I have expertise in this area, obviously the rules as they stand, and I understand them very well, don't enable me to give what would be technically expert evidence. But what I hope to do is present you with enough information for you to consider whether you need to get more information yourselves on this important topic. Uh, I'd like to begin with the observation that density, people per hectare, is an indicator which has no simple connection with emissions, despite some of the language and response in both the plan and the comments on my submission. And also just to begin with a little language that people talk about there's two types of density, generalized density, which is, you know, the density of a whole city averaged, and then what's called focal density, which is density at a much more granular or neighborhood level. And it's that type of density when it's associated with local character, connectivity, mixed use, adaptability, a quality public realm, integrated decision making and some sense of community participation that can have a real impact on emissions. In broad terms, planning affects urban emissions in two ways. It affects building energy services um, in a variety of ways, which I've noted there, and it also affects transport options and choices. And this is where your creation of focal density becomes important. Um, the location and form of development in relation to services, amenities, employment, local design quality, a quality public realm and enabling agency and community cohesion are all factors driven by the planning system. And it really matters. Uh, we know from 25, 30 years of research that planning has a significant influence on how people choose to travel and the nature and length of the trips they make. These in turn influence transport emissions and the cumulative effect is very large. And I wanna make the point here, this is about how these decisions influence existing residents and their choices as well as new residents. That's a point that we'll I'll come back to in a minute. 
The Climate Change Commission, for example, in their first advice to government notes that reducing emissions through the design of towns and cities depends on decisions that are made today. And the importance of this is reflected in the NPSUD, which both at the policy and objective level talks about supporting reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, sorry, what's happened there? Excuse me. Um, and these are positive obligations which are framed in unambiguous terms. So if we look at Wellington, and this picture on the right is from Wellington's Te Atakura, its own emissions reduction strategy, and it shows estimated vehicle kilometres per person based on census and WCC data. Um, so what you see is that in that inner city area, and crucially that area within the town belt, you see um, that there are very low, relatively speaking, journeys per kilometre, and that's correlated with relatively low emissions. Conversely, as you move further out, um, you see per capita emissions rise. Now, I think what's happened in Wellington is people have focused on the planning date on up to now on new emissions, and they've done something like gone, oh, well, those are low emission areas. So if we have uh, development in those areas, more development in those areas, emissions won't be at large. In other words, they're comparing sprawl with new buildings more in the inner city. But the crucial thing is that the way you do development affects existing emissions, which are much larger than the increments you get from new development. The proposed plan simply states that the built environment supports a net reduction by 2050, which is well beyond the statutory time frame for the district plan. And the question is what happens until then? It's a kind of kick emissions for touch objective. And in relation to urban form, it simply states that a compact form contributes to reducing carbon emissions. Now, it's true that there's an association between compact form and lower emissions, but that's very different from actively supporting lower emissions. The broad problem with the proposed plan is that it focuses on um, quite broad brush upzoning and emphasizes inner city development. It envisages a large number of areas where you could build relatively large single developments. And the likely outcome of that sort of approach is what I would call pepper potting of such structures with few controls on the nature, location and form of these and their impact on existing communities. And the problem with that is that it puts existing focal density at risk and doesn't really create new focal density. And supporting emission reductions requires a much clearer direction as to the location, form and sequence of developments. We know that from Northern Europe. We know that from uh, the evidence from the UK and elsewhere where people have actually set out to achieve that. So what reduces emissions? Focal density in the right place with the right links. So the first thing to know is that Large changes in motorised vehicle use and hence emissions are associated with changes from low to medium density. From what you might find in, you know, some of the newer outer suburbs of Wellington and the sort of, sort of thing you see in Newtown, Mount Cook, Arrow Valley, those sort of changes in density are what drive the big reductions in emissions. And it's not just density, it's creating more localised walkable communities with services and amenities closer at hand for both existing and new residents. And then you need to link these urban villages, 15 minute communities by public transport and active modes to other clusters and centres. So in Wellington, what that would mean is increases in focal density and relatively low density outer areas rather than broad brush potential increases in average density in relatively high density areas. Um, for example, 
Um, if you think of somewhere like Miramar, um, Miramar has a traditional town center built around where the old tram stops used to be. And then it has a large area of big box um, car parking around there. And if you thought about that area with a particular focus on these relatively low quality newish commercial buildings and car parking becoming medium density mixed use, then the crucial thing you do there is you improve access to local services, not just for the people in those facilities, but for new residents as well, but for existing residents. So what you're trying to do to reduce emissions quickly if you're trying to support emission reductions is create situations where existing people who make a lot of trips by car have the opportunity to make more local trips access more local services. That's what emissions reduction planning is all about. Um, so we need to really more actively prioritize retrofitting suburbia and what's called straw repair and particularly in the plan, we could include a more precise emission reduction objective to manage the rate, form and scale of development to reduce building and transport emissions over the life of the plan. Amend the built environment explanatory text as suggested here, and then review the provisions throughout the plan to implement this evidence-based approach. So I'll stop there and um, stop screen sharing and, uh, come back to you with a, um, I said I'd pause and allow people at this point to ask questions. Um, I know that's a bit of a rush through, but what I'm simply trying to do is illustrate that there's both a huge body of knowledge about what sort of planning reduces emissions and that the approach in the Wellington plan, the proposed plan doesn't really align with that. So I had an initial question, Mr. Mm -hmm. That can you point us to any uh, quantification of um, carbon emissions under different scenarios? That uh, and it is when you say that we need more work, is that the work that we need? We need more more analysis of, of where the carbon emissions coming from, and what would happen under different scenarios? Yes, <laughs> that is that is very much. Uh, and, and those scenarios need to be varied enough. The, the problem is that we've kind of gone sprawl on the one hand and the current proposals on the other, whereas what you want to look at is, say, some spot zoning, some emphasis on this sort of focal density and lower density areas and compare that with both sets of options. Um, so yes, I'm, I have looked for and suggested to the council that they need to do that sort of work. So I'd very much encourage you to get some information about different scenarios. And I suppose I'm thinking, I have seen some emissions analysis in various fields. And the, the question I'm asking myself is that, is what confidence we could have that that kind of further work or the results of that further work would be available in a time frame that was useful to us and <laughs> like at a time, at, at, and in the knowledge that a time frame that is useful to us is weeks not months and is and that the, the end result wouldn't be so contestable it's just to open up another whole range of debate in itself. <laughs> maybe, um, that, maybe that's a bit cynical, but <laughs> as I say, I, I have seen carbon emission analyses debated uphill and down dale. And I think that's true. The problem is that we have both an injunction in the national policy statement on urban design and a huge and pressing global problem to address. And there are genuine risks from the approach set out in the PDP. I mean, one approach would be simply rather than commission specific analysis for Wellington to commission some work which looks at the, this body of evidence um, because it's, it's large and it's substantial and it's relatively settled science. Nobody in general um, outside the rather heated kind of debates around the spatial plan and so on in Wellington would actually dispute that 
the European model of kind of focused and sequence focal development gives you much lower uh, carbon emissions than um, a less uh, integrated and well planned approach. I mean, one of the interesting things I share with you is that the average density, the generalized density of suburban Stockholm is actually lower than the generalized density of suburban Los Angeles. And that's that's an averaging thing. What makes Stockholm and those other European countries have much lower car dependence, much lower emissions, is that they have actively planned to build new communities so that they never they never do the sort of generalized spread. They go, well, we're going to have medium and high density here. And even if it's a new community on the periphery. So I would say there's a comprehensive body of evidence enough that you could draw on, but whether there's actual modeling available for Wellington, I don't think so. And that's a, a problem with the prep work that's been done, but you should be able to get uh, in reasonably good time, uh, some analysis of what international evidence would tell you about three or four different scenarios. I invite my colleagues from any other questions before you carry on, because I see you want to talk to us about uh, mm -hmm. the Arrow Valley. Uh, hello, Mr. Sapsford. Haven't seen you for a while. Um, Sorry, it's, oh, is that is that oh, Lindsay? It is. It <laughs> Hello, is. Lindsay. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Um, just re, re, you know, you know, I'm a planner. I'm actually looking at the words involved in the yeah. strategic objective levels, which is the purpose of this hearing. Yeah. So, presumably, your relief that you are seeking is to remove. I don't know whether you've got it in front of you, but SRCC01, which is the first strategic uh, objective relating to sustainability, resilience, and climate change. And that's the one which says a net reduction in the city's carbon emissions yes. by 2050. So you're looking to, to get to remove that and replace it with your wording about managing the right form and scale of development to reduce building, et cetera. Is that, is that what you're that, seeking? Here? That's correct. Um, and that's absolutely right. And then there's a little bit of text under the next set of objectives, which talks about compact form, which I think probably also should be amended. But yes, thank you, Lindsay. That's and, absolutely and, spot on. And, and the remainder of that strategic objectives about um, supporting more energy efficient buildings, increasing use of renewable energies, healthy yes. of native ecosystems. They're, they're, they're all good. They're all consistent with your views. They're, they're all consistent. Yes. OK. All right. Thank you. Any more on the scene? Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Sapsford. David McMahon's here. Um, well, good morning, David. Thanks for your answer to that previous question. That was um, certainly on my mind too, so it's good to have that clarification. Um, earlier on in your uh, um, presentation, you talked about one of the policies in the MPSUD. Yes. I think it was policy three. Yes. Um, no, sorry, policy one in relation to supporting reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. That's clause E. Yes. And um, you might have touched on F2 about um, climate change. Yep. And that just struck uh, a chord with me. And I, I looked at um, that policy obviously gives effect to objective eight, mm -hmm. of which is dealing with reductions in greenhouse emissions and resilience. And then the remainder of that document is largely silent on the implementation of those objectives and policies. In fact, I, reading, reading through what you were talking, the emphasis is really on development and yes. um, there doesn't seem to be any attempt in the document to reconcile the policy on greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions and um, intensity. Uh, is, uh, that no. your, is that your that reading? Is, that would be my reading as well. Um, I think it's left it wide open effectively to councils, you know, 
uh, it's a clear direction and in terms of you know the I'm sorry I, I don't have the case at my hand you know the run from King Salmon I think it was that's a clear direction in an NPS so people need to do it but there's very little about the how and yes. um, and that's why I feel for the position you're in because I don't think that the council has fully turned its mind to what the evidence tells us and looked at options about how to achieve that objective. So I would agree with you. There's little in the document that suggests how you achieve that objective beyond saying it's very clear that you must support reductions. Yes. Just following up on this question. Uh, what the NPSUD is clear about on the how is effectively the antithesis to the uh, position that you're supporting, which is broad ranging uh, rezoning over large areas around, uh, around city centres, metropolitan centres, local centres, uh, potentially local centres, and in, uh, in walkable distance of uh, train stations. So uh, as, as you've said, just agree, well, there's not a lot in the NPSUD about how to achieve uh, emission reduction, but there is an awful lot about the nature and scale of development. And it's, it's not focusing on uh, kind of precise development that you're talking about. So where do we meet in the middle? Uh, I think, you know, I that is the balancing act that needs to be struck. But I guess, you know, as we all know, one can't assume, one has to assume that there is coherence in a, in a document. So I guess the way I would say it is that the NPSUD in general, was written for um, the Aucklands and Christchurches of uh, this world, but it covers New Zealand, Tauranga and other centres. And um, so the way I would interpret that is that there is an injunction in general to look at um, improving density around transport routes and in city centres, but that you need to do that in a way that also contributes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so that would imply that you need to modify the general approach set out there to deal with the particular circumstances of a given town or sublocation. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that possibly the people writing it just had a general um, association between density and emissions in their mind and weren't really thinking about what the evidence tells us around how you drive emission reductions from existing users. So I think you have got a balancing act there and all I, I guess I would say is that the evidence uh, as I see it points towards modifying that general injunction which you're quite clear which I agree with you the NPS uh, in the circumstances of Wellington in order to more actively support reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. David, I interrupted you. Do you have any left? Oh, okay. What's that? No, we didn't. Yeah, okay. Oh, hi, Roland. It's Jane Black here. How are oh, you? hello, Jane. <laughs> How are you? Um, I was just, just expanding on that a little, little bit. My, so, so crudely put, and not suggesting that you you wouldn't necessarily expand the walkable catchment around the city centre, but you might around the, the Miramars or the local centres, but you might also increase height in those areas on closer to those centres that you'd consider to be ripe for focal density. density. Yes, in a way that reinforces the urban form. I mean, the big thing about, and you know, Jane, I, I know you know about this as well, you'd want to expand, you'd want to not look at, it's not just having a general enabling provision, it's looking at how you would increase, say, and I'm using Miramar as an example, you know, you've got a lot of those big car parking areas and single story um, retail. And, you know, if those had, um, 
higher heights enable towards the center of the sites and lower out towards the periphery and were constructed in a way that reinforced the the kind of compact urban form which exists to a small extent around the shopping <coughs> center you know so yes in general I think that's right. I think the biggest thing that we know from Europe is the importance of doing this with some care so that you reinforce the good, the walkability, the existing services and minimize the kind of massive shading and other problems that can arise from just random locations of things. But yes, in broad terms, I think what you're suggesting is right. Thank you. Uh, be quick. Okay. Okay. Whilst talk to us about the Arrow Valley. All right, just I'm just trying. It's Robert Scoglet here, Roland. Hello. Um, just trying to understand the dimensions of your replacement objective because you say manage the rate, form, and scale. So that obviously seems to tie in with your comment earlier in your statement that the plan provides little guidance on controls over the impacts of single large development. So it's, it's one of the dimensions of that objective that it would lead into the district plan by way of policies and rules and things around greater control over development or large scale development. Uh, greater control over where things happen and the form in which they happen. So, you know, um, as I say, the the model underpinning the plan at the moment envisages that you could have just things springing up on individual sites and what you need to provide is more uh, guidance as to exactly where you might put these these developments. So yes, I, I in essentially yes, that's that's what um, what you're suggesting is correct. OK, it just, just seems to reflect some of the submissions we heard last week. And I'm just thinking of the Newtown residents in particular who were putting just that proposition for Newtown. Well, I think it's a very, you know, uh, Newtown would be a really interesting example because you could uh, intensify in particular locations in ways which didn't damage the coherence of the existing community, but did reinforce um, local services and by providing a stronger base. I mean, uh, I know Newtown quite well and, you know, there are site, if you think about, and I'm not saying the plan can specify this, right? I'm just saying the sort of things on the corner of, I think it's Main Street and Ridderford Street, there's a car park outside the Accident and Emergency Department. And that would be a classic site to put um, some medium density with some you know, you could probably go up several stories towards the back of that site uh, with an active frontage and retail there. And if it's something like the hospital did, and here's how emissions reduction works. If that was a, a hospital facility where more hospital staff, for example, lived there instead of traveling from Tawa or Setun, you know, then that's a really practical example of how this would generate emissions reductions. As I'm not saying you can do that at a, that level of granularity, but just that's an illustration of how you would see this kind of development leading to emissions reductions. OK, thank you. Uh, so Mr. Sassford, uh, so I've occupied nearly half an hour <laughs> the Arrow Valley, so please proceed. All right, thank you. Um, I'll just go back to uh, screen sharing. Let me check again that that's coming up okay. Yep. Um, so I, I want to talk about the quality of urban environments and particularly um, and the, the what the NPSUD does say and doesn't say. Uh, and my reason for saying this is that some of the response I've had over the years to these kind of questions is that dealing with things in a more granular way as precluded by the NPSUD. Objective 4 talks about urban environments and amenity values change in response to needs. Now to me this is about responsiveness, it's about people and communities and about it's now and the future. It, it isn't about ignoring adverse effects and it 
you, you can't disregard potential adverse effects because a proper on assessment could be more onerous under the NPSUD. Um, so, and moving on from that idea of opinion about amenities, I guess I'd just say we are living biological creatures and social beings, and certain experiences are generally good or bad for us as, as humans. We all generally benefit from sunlight, green space, views of green space, and a sense of connection and community, as well as a sense of agency. And you'll find these sort of things expressed in New Zealand's urban design protocol, which is still current um, back from 2005. Um, and the way these matters play out through the planning system is, among other ways, through using the resource consent process to provide granular decision making. I've just included here, I won't go through this in detail, but the urban design protocol provides guidance around what matters in general for a well functioning urban environment. And I think this is a useful point of reference to go back to when we're thinking about this. We relate this to the proposed district plan. Wellington is a uniquely folded landscape amongst tier one cities. It, topography matters. Uh, the proposed district plan, in my view, lacks the granularity needed to maintain and enhance the quality of the urban environment and enable people and communities to meet their needs. Um, and Aro Valley is an exemplar of how this plays out in practice. I've included in my submission, and I won't read this through because I know we're short of time, that um, Aro Valley is a steep east-west valley. It has folded ridge lines. Um, it's, it's dense, particularly when you consider that around 60% of the land area is actually protected green space. So the density on the available um, sites is around double that you get from an average density for the suburb. It's got intact and distinct heritage character, strong walkability and a lot of mature green space. It has very restrictive rules and I put restrictive. There's 40% site coverage, um, height, low height limits and 45 degree recession planes. These usually trigger a resource consent, but to 99.9% .9 those consents are granted. What the what the resource consent process does is enables the negotiation around site specific effects and opens the door to conversations about shading. Um, in terms of the proposed plan, matters such as sunlight, dampness, privacy and personal safety are not simply issues of aesthetics and opinions about amenity. They go to the core of whether people and communities can meet their needs and provide for their health and safety. And Aro Valley offers a stark example of how the PDP fails to consider the interaction of topography and insulation. I've provided some site specific details in there and if I understand the process those are for here hearing stream two, but I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. This is a thing called Argo Trust, which is a long term residential care facility um, for people with severe mental and physical disabilities. There are six bedrooms across the front there, um, uh, and most of the people who are there will spend their entire lives in this facility. It's a long term care facility. It's well integrated in the neighborhood. It's set back and up from the road. The problem with the uh, current PDP is that the site, its site ends just outside those bedrooms and uh, under the, the operative plan, anything significant in front of them would go through a resource consent process. Um, but under the proposed plan, um, you could build six to eight stories directly in front of that. Um, here's another example which I want to illustrate. This is all infill housing and it gives you an idea of the kind of granular density that exists in, in Aro Valley. Um, what's important to note is that the current planning rules, if you look at that building there, I think it's on the left on my screen at least, maybe on the right on yours, the grey building facing the road, the recession planes go through the middle of that second story and 
the purpose to which they were put when these two developments were produced was not around saying you can't build that. It was giving people in the planning department the ability to have conversations about exactly where the roof lines went up the ridge and little step down designs so that sunlight was shared fairly in that situation. And if you look at that, if you take a site visit or wander up there, you'll see there's an extraordinary alignment of the different buildings all around there with um, what you might call the winter sunlight planes. Uh, so in essence, my proposal is at the strategic level, there should be an additional objective to maintain, manage development, to maintain and enhance the quality of the built environment. Um, <coughs> and that uh, the way to implement that might be through an additional qualifying matter, which I appreciate as a tool for developing rules rather than something that sits in the plan itself, <laughs> that the localised impacts of topography on the quality of the urban environment. Um, and in general, Aro Valley needs more granular spot zoning, um, reflecting the urban design protocol, providing for you, you could increase heights um, on specific sites where the quality of the environment can be maintained, and those are relatively straightforward to identify, but that in general, you need resource consent assessments to manage design and effects on sunlight, privacy, wind, arriving from topography on a site-by-site -site basis. This is just the reality of uh, the valley, um, you know, where the sun is in winter, the way wind flows through there. And I guess these matters about topography are additional and distinct from the considerations of character and heritage. So I'll come to that in a moment. I said I would put these two things together. My final point very briefly is about um, the treaty. Um, in Kōtearoa Tene, Justice Joe Williams, who's now on the Supreme Court, talked about the treaty as um, an exchange of solemn promises and went on to say, this is not just about uh, kaitiaki control of taonga, it also implies an infusion of the core motivating principles of Mataronga Māori into all aspects of our national life. And so it's really just an invitation I wanted to say here as someone who worked in this area for a while and really believes in that approach to say, um, thinking about how the core motivating principles underpinning Mataoronga and Tikanga are embedded throughout the plan. And just to pause and reflect from time to time on how this broader task is going. And, and one focus could be on the plan, how the plan implicitly treats relationships between people and communities. And that's different to the more formal connections between council processes and EV leadership. So that's really just a very um, general uh, comment about the treaty approach, which I, I strongly support, but just thinking about how one might bring a lens to that as the process proceeds. And that uh, is the end of what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, panel. We have uh, a really tight time. I wonder if we can focus on the suggested strategic objective and qualifying matter. And if uh, commissioners have any questions about uh, Mr. Sapsford's comments on the treaty, because uh, as he says, the RO Valley stuff will be otherwise will be for stream two. Lindsay. Um, thank you, Mr. Sapp. So again, I'm, I'm interested in your final um, suggestion of a strategic objective relating to uh, maintaining and enhancing the quality of the environment. Are you, I don't, I don't know if you've got it in front of me, but where this idea comfortably sits within the framework of strategic objectives is probably UFD 07. So it right. talks about creations of livable, well-functioning urban environments, enabling people and communities to provide the, for the full well-beings, mm -hmm. and then as, as, as a whole lot of ways in which development would achieve this. Isn't what you're suggesting broadly encompassed in that, or does, do you think that it needs 
oh, a nuancing or does you thinking, well, that can remain as it is and we need a completely new, new objective about the quality of the environment? Uh, it's a, I mean, I agree. I guess the reason that, you know, I, I'm proposing this commission today is that the material which seems to have flowed from that doesn't address quality of the urban environment at a granular level in a way that you would need to achieve all those objectives. So I guess my thinking is, well, do we need to specifically talk about maintaining and enhancing the quality of the urban environment? Um, you know, you you may well reach the view that it's encompassed by those points. I guess what I'm looking at is what those objectives have led people to consider in the plan, in particular the absence of this um, granularity around um, the quality of urban environments. And there's more of a broad brush approach than a kind of spot zoning approach, which is related to the particular features uh, of landscape and how sites relate to one another. So I, I think you're making a fair point. I guess my view was maybe we need to put a clear objective about maintaining enhancing quality because otherwise the provisions in the plan may well not deliver on what's in that section. Okay, thank you. Uh, but we also have to take into account what the NPSUD tells us to do in relation to well-functioning urban environments, because there's no mention of the word amenity values within the NPSUD. Uh, no, so that was the point I made at the beginning, that this is, the NPSUD talks about opinions about amenity. But actually there are, if you look at the definition of environment um, uh, and the way part two is structured, the NPSUD is actually silent on the things which can be seen as objectively valuable for people and communities. So that um, it's amenity is one aspect of that, but both in the statutory scheme and generally, some objective sense of what makes for a quality well-functioning environment I would say is not precluded by the NPSUD at all. It's it's it, the way the amenity clause is written is almost around uh, people's opinions about aesthetic matters but that's different from does this shade this building. That's not an aesthetic point. That's that these things are objectively good or bad for people you know. Um, and you know, if we, I hope I don't need to bring uh, too much evidence to support that point from a public health point of view. I just, I would say the NPSUD doesn't mention amenity except in the sense that opinions can change, but amenity is not all there is to the quality of the environment in an urban setting, and particularly the quality of the built environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, last call. Just a, just a question, Mr. Chair. Is it possible to get a copy of that presentation? Ask Mr. Sanders. Yes, the uh, one you just had. Uh, oh yes, I've emailed it through to um, uh, Jazz and Freya. Is it? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's us, Mr. Sapsford. We appreciate uh, your time. I hope uh, the sun is shining in Melbourne. Um, Often, but not this morning. <laughs> Let me say. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, and I guess I will. I will see you again in uh, one or two of the other hearing streams. Thank you very much for your time and for listening and engaging. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sampsford. We'll adjourn now. hearing now until eleven o'clock.
Um, just sort of the um, before I pass the word to my uncles, uh, the order of the things they'll be speaking first, and I'll be <coughs> as the Runanga planner will speak to our submission. So I'll give the floor to them. Oh, Kāpiti <laughs> A ko te pō tuatahi, ko te pō tuarua, ko te ata, ko te au tūroa, ko te au mārama, hui te mārama, hui te ora, haumi e, hui e, kai ki e. Uh, e me tau hau au ki tēnei kaupapa. Aku haere tanga mai te, te mahi tēnei rā, atahi au i rongo. Hau, mori e, hau to me e, tau hau. Oh, sorry. You to the sushi. I, I am new to this matter before the commissioners today, and I've come here this morning. Express my thoughts on the matter before us. It's not as if I'm new to the history of Ngāti Toa. And our ancestral rights to this area. Nearly 200 years we've been fighting for this land and this issue. And my principal concern today is the inclusion of other groups, Rangitani, Maupoko, uh, and, and other groups uh, on this particular issue. I have before you documents that demonstrate the rights to land that were given by Governor Gray on this matter. And it says to my friend the Governor, listen, listen. This is an account of my strength. I acquired this island, that, and that island into Waipounamu. And it is as a result of my strength that those rights were recognised and acquired. E hara naia nei nei nei. Ro mua he o fanau kutupuna. It is not a matter that is simply before us today, but it is a historical matter from my ancestors. Ta na mahi he tango fenua, he tango fenua. And that, on, on that occasion, the land was taken. The land was taken. E kore ro ta fito e nei kore. This is an ancestral saying. Uh, 
This is a traditional uh, saying from the Māori Houses of Knowledge. Ana hika. Correct. The right way. Kupu. Words. Communication. Tata. Those who are close, those who have the affinity to the subject. Now, this is a Māori whakaar or from our own, from our old schools. For something to be tika, you had to have the right communication to those who have the affinity about what you want to talk about. In this case here, for it to be tika, for any other iwi to come into our rohe and claim mana whenua status, or tangata whenua status, there needs to be the communication with the right people. To date, that communication has not taken place amongst our Ngāti Tō people. Anyone knows where to find us, right? Instead, this communication or this kupu has taken places in a hearing like this, in the courts of the land, but that's not the right people that have the affinity to this land that have the whakapapa and that have the history. We have no qualms with any of these people coming to us. And calling or heiha nga me, what are all of the things that are concerning you? So we have the opportunity through words, through affiliation, to make it correct for all. When nga kōrero or tawhito te whare wānanga, that is still applicable today. This is the traditional uh, saying in the Māori Houses of Knowledge. Ko kōrero ke ngā hitori o Ngāti tō, i rutu ngā kreimi o te srai pūnara. The history of Ngāti tō uh, to this land has already been traversed in the Waitangi Tribunal. And well documented, as we know. Now, kore, kore, kore rawa mātou whakai, mā koutou, mā tētahi atu rānei, e me ana me whakauru tēnei iwi, tēnei iwi, tēnei. We will never ever concede to allow you today or any other person uh, to say that another iwi has mana whenua status here. I don't want to have to expand upon the history. But I can. It is my understanding that you'll already be aware uh, based on the proceedings that have taken place in relation to this area. Ko te whakauru, i a etahi atu, i runga i te, I te, I rotu i te kauni hera, hei ahi kā, hei mana whenua, hei tangata whenua rānei. Kore rawa mātou e whakaai ki tēnā. And, so and so my principal opposition is to the inclusion of other groups uh, into the status as mana whenua or tangata whenua today. We will never agree to that. In Taranaki Fanri, I'm sorry, Mr. E Pana ki Taranaki Fanri. I rotu i o mātou kore ro kare kau hei we e ki ana Taranaki Fanri. And according to our traditions, there is no particular iwi called Taranaki Fanri. Mehe me ko Taranaki Fanri, o ai rato. Hea hanga hapu, hea hanga iwi ki rotu o te rā, ohu Taranaki Fanri. If there is such a thing, who are the hapu and who are the iwi that comprise of Taranaki Fanui? If I am a hapu, Ngati Tama, Kungati Mutunga, Kotiati Awa, Karekawera to Onga Onga iwi or Taranaki. It's not Taranaki Fanui. I will accept. Uh, Ngāti Mutunga, Ngāti Tama and Te Aotearoa to a certain extent, but not any of the other Taranaki groups. Uke anō au ki ngā hekenga o mātou tūpuna, mai kāwhe, mai Taranaki. I refer now to the great migrations of our ancestors from Kāwhia and down to Taranaki. I tērā rautau te tahi rau, tahi mano e uwa rau, o e warura, in the 1800s. 
ara ungati tama ungati mutunga kote atia. In the 1800 migrations, it was Ngāti Tama, Ngāti Mutunga, Te Atiawa. We he mea ko Ngāti Rua nui mea tahi atu, kā reo i whakai, i te mea. Pawhai tonu mātou i rotu i e rā hekenga. Nā rātou tonu i patu e tahi o mātou tūpuna i mua tō rātou tāinga mai ki konei ki te upohoti. If you were to claim that Ngāti Rua nui or any other Taranaki group is comprised of those that uh, migrated, then I would strongly disagree. And in fact, it was them uh, that caused uh, contestation and dispute during the migrations. And it's the same today. I ahua mahue i ngā kremi, i ngā whenua o te upokotika. I hara nā mātou te he, nā te kāwana kē te he. And for this area in Wellington, there have been many occasions when Ngā Te Tua have been simply left out, and that's not a, a, a not our fault. Nā pai. Nō reira kai a kūranga tira. Puia pētaku hai kōrero hai tīmata. Your motto, Kopapa ite neira te nakoto, te nakoto rauranga tira maikia. And to the commissioners, I want to thank you uh, for hearing our opening address. Uh, my acknowledgements to you. I think that was the first part. Kete tika. Ah, kia ora. We're not adverse to having a corridor to any of these people, and we're trying to sort that out before a commission sorts it out. I don't know how we got to this point. What I do. I leave that to my friends to discuss, but I'd like to acknowledge you all here for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Nunui, Miyaroha, Kiaque, Moto, Moto Corridor. Inga Faka Papa, Inga Mana Finuatanga, Ungati Totini. This is not a question to you, but I just want to acknowledge you for um, expressing to us today the genealogy and the status of Ngati Tor according to your view to us today. Kia ora. <coughs> Hello, Tinando Tata, Kaita Fari, Kaita Tepu, Kaiko Mihuna, Kumihana. They are to me Hikia Koto, a five five noi hone in a coral or talk with two a canna, a whole hippa. I don't think a coral, a cotacoto, Kaimui Teluan. Medical today. And my role now is to follow on from my uh, from the opening remarks of my colleague and friend, uh, Hohepa. Ah, uh, ingari kano hoa, kano fikai kia, kia tua kia hau ki runga ke ia koutou ingari kia noho, kano hi ki te kano hi. But I want to sit on an even and level playing field with you, so I won't be standing, I'll be sitting. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, um, welcome you all to our whenua. Pahako no koutou te whare, no mātou tunu te whenua, te mana whenua. Although this house may be one that belongs to the council, according to our tradition, we are the ones who have mana whenua status here. Uh, I'd just like to further endorse all the statements that have been said by my tuakano or my elder tungane or sibling, and our whakapapa, he sits as an elder to me, and um, it's a privilege to have him here this morning, considering he's been in hospital all last week. Uh, but as soon as these kaupapa who turn up, he got his backpack, his electric pack for his heart, and we picked them up and we're here. It's sort of just to emphasise the seriousness of what's happening. The ability for these people to once more, uh, as Hippa stated, claim mana whenua, tangata whenua status. Um, I think you really need to have an understanding of the difference of what those words mean. 
you can only ask yourself, I can't ask you whether you have a concept of mana or mana whenua or tangata whenua, which was expressed in Te Tiriti or Waitangi. You're probably familiar with tangata whenua. It's a term given to all Māori through the treaty. Now, when we're talking about mana whenua, that's the people who have authority. Next year in 2024, Ngāti Tō celebrates will commemorate the 200 years of the Battle of Waiorua on Kāpiti Island. I'm assuming you all understand what that is, what the Battle of Waiorua and how significant it is to our history here uh, and our history in New Zealand, Aotearoa. Um, and here we are, as my cousin uh, referred to, 200 years later having the same bloody discussion because of a faulty process, because of a commissioner allowing this to happen because of a fast-tracked ruling. I don't know, anything fast-tracked. You ask yourselves, what would be the intent and purpose of fast-tracking a ruling of that commissioner? I'd love to have that person's name. So now I can tell my ear with the person responsible for a lot of this nonsense that a tonga found within a certain level of strata. Now, if it precludes Nati Tor being here, now we don't have ahika and we don't have mana over those tonga by a commissioner. That just infuriates me one person who has no idea about our culture, obviously, and for some reason put that through to cause all this stuff to give Mūpoko Rangitane an opportunity to reinvigorate their ahika or their mana whenua status. And I support my cousin we will absolutely refute any thought or intention of that happening. You understand that the treaty process costs millions and millions of taxpayer money? We have followed that process through to the letter. And now we're sitting here with you people having to have this discussion as we move into the commemorations of our, ex of our ascension to mana whenua 200 years we've had to endure this. Now, we're all sitting in, the, in this room now because you have an opportunity as commissioners and in your positions of authority to set it right. So, e kore rawa a Ngāti Tō. E kore, kore rawa. We will never agree to that happening because you've just well, what, what was all that for? 30 years of trauma, of recalling all our trauma for our whenua, where over 27 of my kaumatu were the original claimants and only one got to see it through to its fruition. Think about that. One, for all those original claimants of our treaty claim, one got to see it through to its fruition. Now, because of your council workers, people, officers, and their limited experience, I suppose, um, with dealing with Māori. I know what it's like. Councils only last for three years. Workers come and go. Ngāti Tōra enduring. We're not going nowhere. So think about that. So to support my cousin and honours mahi that she's done for our iwi, I'll take the words of Tamihana Te Raupraha. And I don't like to quote them too much. Or Martin Te Fifi. You know. There are a couple of guys trying to do the best for their time, given their circumstances. Ingari, no hea, hoki, etaia. That's probably one of the most strongest statements of all our treaty claim process. Our land court documents, there was absolutely no way, no way, e kore hoki e taia. 
Otherwise, you just undermined all that stuff I just talked about. So think about that. Think about this commissioner. Think about the iwi that are probably having an opportunity, taking the best of an opportunity to reaffirm their mana within te whanganui ātara. There's a certain extent, a certain degree where, you know, given the chance, good on them. But that's not mana. You can't go to a Crown agent and receive mana. You understand that that iwi you're dealing with, only reason why they're in Levin and Taitoko is because they got a gratuity for one of their ancestors fighting with the Crown. Not under the laws of what we call Tu Mātauinga, which is the God of War, and Ua Nuku Kaitangata. I'll let you uh, translate that. Uh, um, God of cannibalism. <laughs> Māu te a tētahi uh, whakapake a tanga pai ake. Ua Nuku Kaitangata. Ua Nuku was a taonga brought over on the Tainui canoe. It's one of our oldest living relics. It goes probably older than a few thousand years. And that represents the God of War. And when in war, oh, how can I put it in a Pākehā way? All's fair in love and war. I'll just leave it at that, Kāpai. All's fair in love and war. That's Ua Nuku Kaitangata. So, when you have those mantras, we're in iwi that came down here and muru rau patui te whenua, meant we cleared the land. My cousin talked about it. It's written in the letters. In order to establish our ahi kā, here in the whole of Te Upoko Te Ika, from Rangi Tike, Whangaehu, the pub's no longer there, but the stream will be enduring, the Whangaehu, all the way to the top of the South Island. Manati Tor have interest in uh, all of those lands. It's been re-emphasised. We're part of one of the tribes that were part of a 20 million acre land grab from the Crown. Kapai. Now, I thought we had sorted our story. You know, we've had people our Komatu come through and put all our evidence on the table. So, if I could re-emphasise to you all, you need to scratch whatever that other commissioner sorted out. You have the power to do it. Challenge them, because you'd have our backing. Now, that's no corner uh, towards Mūpoko Rangi Tāne Ngaitara, but if you get that as a precedence, you're now saying, in theory, Ngāpuhi could go and claim the whole of Kahununu. You're now saying that Ngāti Pro can come and com come down and claim Queen Elizabeth Park. So stop the silliness, okay? Because it's stupid silliness, really. Get some clarity around and inform your, yourselves properly about the situation. Can't I? We, I have no thing towards those other tribes trying, I suppose, to do the best with their iwi. But I will not tolerate a Pākehā system getting us to fight amongst each other for your people's entertainment. Eki eki. Eki eki. Ka pakele te ringa ringa. I tō koutou kuare. I object strongly to ignorance. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Because you understand your felt my disdain towards the whole kaupapa. And I want to leave it there. I even took the pake. That's a big thing when you pake your in Māori them. But I'm not going to take it any further. We've said what we've said. I support my cousin. Once again, Taranaki Whānui are using the system, the process, to elevate themselves to ahika. When did Ngāti Tō's ahika ever, ever get extinguished in Te Pane o Te Ika? Go and walk across the parliament. There's a mere pounamu that this, oh no, I don't know that guy on the end, that a certain relation of ours took into parliament to remind governments 
te ati awa, taranaki whanui, who have the mana of whanganui atara? It's called tawhito whenua. It resided at taputeranga. And that kuia that we saved, ta mairangi, and, and married te rangi haeta, gave us the mana of the whole of the whanganui atara. Tikanga Māori tuturu. Māori customary law binding. Not a commissioner, a group of councillors who might be there for three years. That's not enduring. This section of your community is the enduring community. We're going nowhere, never have since the time we've been here. We don't necessarily encourage our people to move away. In fact, we have a whole strategy to encourage our people to move home. So how the hell can we do that if we're still fighting amongst with the Crown, still after all this time? So I think, with what my cousin has said, what I'm saying to you, we have never extinguished our ahika. And there are reasons by ahika doesn't mean by virtue of the fact that you live somewhere because there's a historical layer to te Whanganui Atara, a historical context. And I don't even want to get there. And you're probably familiar with Kawana Cray and the things that he did to force and the causal effects of that particular person. And here we are, 200 years, having to talk about that, really? I'd much rather be talking about how we can work together moving forward in the future. So, all I can say, with respect, can you fellas sort yourselves out, please? And you tell those people, if they want to have a corner up, we've been over the hill for a couple of hundred years, we're not going anywhere, no my heart of my, please. And in conclusion, That was my understanding in the treaty process that there is nothing matters pre the signing of the Treaty of Waitau. We played that game and we had to. What's wrong with everyone else not playing it? So, once again, to re emphasize pre 1840, nothing else matters. Who has the mana? Please get some distinctions between the general term of tangata whenua and mana whenua. Ngāti tō have ahi kā from, like I said, the rangi tike to the top of the south. Um, it's all in our research. Is there anything else I should add while I'm here? I think that's pretty much. Do you get the idea? No reader. Any questions? Oh, we're doing it, so if you've got questions, so I can answer. You might have something now, and then I'm going to hand it to Andu. No? Thank you. Well, commissioners. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my uncle Kaho and um, for their quarter. I'm a Hinui uncles. Um, so, kia ora everyone. Um, nam Hinui kia kato katoa. Um, ko waiaho ko karadenis te mona ko kachka te monga. Ko um, Lazme Adige at the Turkish Iwi, Ko uh, Honor Octum Lewis Dokungwa, no Poriwa Ho, Ko Kaifakama Here Here, or Tuarunanga or Tuaranga Tira. Um, thank you very much for being able to speak to our submission today and for listening to our Pakaro. My name is Honor Octum Lewis and I'm the principal planner for the Runanga or Tuaranga Tira. So I'll be making six points today. Uh, all points will be made as they relate to our written submission and um, in the same order it was written. Uh, dated 14 September 2022. First of all, I'd like to start my quarter with our planning more moya. So that's resource management planning, um, because it is not our intention to argue or discuss issues after the fact, such as the submission process does. Um, Ngāti Tua planning team envisions that EWI is actively resourced involved in RMA processes. This means that we seek honest partnerships with Konohera we can then write and co-design our own planning provisions so that we're not imposed any planning provisions. This will also remove the need for costly and lengthy submission processes and enhance Ngāti towards mana, but will significantly improve our tayo. 
So to date, the planning provisions didn't necessarily monarchy what Ewe and Maori wants to achieve within the provisions that the district plans or regional plans got to offer. This is simply because the obvious categorizations that the RMA requires us to follow. The, um, the chapters, for instance, usually do not speak to each other and they remain separate to their own course. This doesn't reflect how Iwi sees Tayo and the Fenua. So our vision is that by getting involved in crafting provisions, we will put our vision forward for what we want to see our Tayo and Fenua to look like. And by that, this is a good segue to my first point. I note and repeat, I'll go through the topics in order of how they appear in our submission. So the first point will be historic heritage and sites and areas of significance to Maori. So HH uh, SASM objectives 01 and 05, 05, uh, to 05 are supported. However, proposed plan in general and specifically strategic objectives should have better incorporated cultural resilience to the, um, to the objectives of this chapter in the face of climate change. Our marae and urupa are under threat from climate change and natural hazards. So we have sadly seen this during the devastating events of uh, Cyclone Gabriel. Our sites are not to be viewed um, just within a compartmentalized historical heritage framework as district plan manages the land use. So climate change resilience of our people are really, really important and should be clearly spelled out in this first um, historic heritage in sites and areas of significance to Maori strategic objectives. My second point will be related to the strategic objectives um, SRCC 01 to SRCC 04. And this point is strongly connected to the point I just made about the cultural resilience. We are in support of these provisions, except that none of the objectives in this section refer to the fact that proposed district plan is building resilience in all affairs, including the cultural resilience. Cultural resilience should be crafted into all the objectives in this section. Mm -hmm. uh, SRCC01 to SRCC04 all have cultural components and they um, uh, and implications for our people and for our spaces in our finwa. Uh, especially SRCC 02 and SRCC 03 language should be inclusive to say, for instance, risks from natural hazards are identified and understood and what it means for Iwi and Māori are specifically documented and appropriately responded in partnership with Mana Whenua. And plan for through adaptation and mitigation measures with Iwi and Māori thoroughly to map the risks for Mana Whenua to ensure the risks are low. Subdivision, development and user managed and responded in a way that ensures Mana Whenua's cultural resilience are provided for within the proposals. And SRCC04 should include the design that Matauranga can inform and is at the centre for Mana Whenua's resilience when it comes to the decision making of these matters. Um, I'm moving on to my third point, which is about urban form and development. And uh, this point is about the limits of coverage and the PDP's level of consideration of EV wants and needs in urban form and development section of the strategic objectives. It is also about the EWI's role in how uh, urban we see urban form and development in Tafanganu Atara and Poneke in Tewshatawatika. Uh, so throughout the plan, the language and the kupu used for Manafenua's role switches between active involvement, active participation, and active partnership. And urban form and development uh, objectives are one of the examples that this needs to be consistent throughout the plan. So UFD 01 to UFD 08, we do not see Manafenua land development aspirations and associated principle of Tinoranga Tiratanga coming through as the objectives to enhance, enrich and indigenize our city. For instance, UFD 02 should have been better worded to express to give effect to Tinoranga Tiratanga on the lands that are returned to Iwi under their Deed of Settlement Act, which are often zoned as open space or rural uh, by the Crown and RM systems where Iwi had no choice in the matter. And process for zoning, Iwi inherited a usually undevelopable and restrictive fenua for realising their own aspirations. And highly connected to this point is the UFD 06, where a variety of housing types, size and tenues, including papakainga options are being available as a point we agree, but the PDP doesn't cater for the nuances of the water papakainga entails. Not having this chapter in the proposed district plan and not specifying what we envision and think papakainga is not adequate for iwi. This is a chapter that should be crafted by iwi and for iwi, expecting a residential or high density and medium density zone provisions covering a permitted baseline for Papakainga to happen 
is a quite a light and naive perspective. Papa Kainga is a very precious course, not only will positively contribute to our, how our city will look and feel like, but is also most importantly connecting our people to their ancestral land that was alienated from them. And last but not least about the UFD objectives, UFD 07 should have included being culturally inclusive, not just respecting of the city's historic heritage, but protecting and maintaining cultural sites in areas of significance. This means that our sites, regardless of how altered and concreted they are, still need to be considered from a lens of resurrection and protection. By the same token, UFD 08 applies to the SASMs as well that all developments should actively look for betterment, responsiveness and resiliencenes of our sites in areas of significance to future development. So that includes our Awa, Moana, all of the Tonga that we have a cultural responsibility for. The fourth point I'd like to make is the uh, cultural well-being under the city economy, knowledge and prosperity. Cultural well-being is such an important part of the, how the Fenua is being used in our city, and yet the only place that is mentioned is in the CEKP05 uh, as part of the strategically important SS that support Maori culture. It is impossible to evaluate CEKP02 and centers hierarchy as we wonder this academic system was ever tested whether it works for iwi and Maori. We cannot change the centers hierarchy right here and right now because this is not the place for it. But it is the city planning theory, but for sure it is a Western construct mm -hmm. that impacting on the way Iwi and Māori lives in, in the city. We're not suggesting to overhaul the hierarchy here, but the fact that whether the hierarchy is tested through Māori way of living and supported as a strategic objective will remain as a question for us. And added to that question is the need for compulsory evaluation of how did this hierarchy served Iwi and Māori over the years in the city. Not to mention, if you control F search CAKP02, it doesn't mention Manafenua at all, and statements on the each center description almost assumes that this is acceptable for Manafenua, or we've accepted it before. Moving on and coming back to this original point that I was making about the CEKP05 cultural well-being concept, that should be incorporated all across the proposed district plan, not just as it relates to the strategic assets that support Maori culture. Uh, fifth point is the Anga Whakamua section. So uh, it, it is about the weak wording of the strategic objective AW03 um, under the Anga Whakamua section. So Runanga supports the objectives of AW01 that we engage as active participants that upholds the treaty, AW02 that our relationship with our Whenua and traditions, traditions are provided for, and AW04 which is about Mana Whenua's role in the development and design of our city. AW03, however, will that its wording need to be improved by deleting the kupa can, as mana whenua should be able to and will exercise kaitia kitanga with their own mataranga. As currently, the objective stands to mean as if though we're seeking permission to execute our roles. And our district plan only enable for the word can rather than having a stronger position for it. Our sixth and my final point is about the natural environment at the Tayo Maori section. So, um, we're in full support of the language and content used there, and we welcome that our principles are written in a way that complements what a district plan should be doing. Only concern regarding these principles will be whether would they carry a weight in consent applications and consent decision making. These principles currently sit in the strategic objectives, but are not necessarily connected to the specific district plan rules. It is comforting, comforting that when mana whenua engagement is triggered through the plan, then we're able to uphold these values during engagement, and it's good to have a strategic anchor that sits in this te, uh, te Māori, but only time will show these principles will actually be used. That as we repeatedly have seen, when policies are not anchored with rules in the district plans, they're usually nice to have uh, for consent applicants, as the applicants are not to be bound with non-regulatory and non-directive wording. Um, we are, however, asking for an amendment made by strengthening the language used in NEO2, where subdivision and earthworks should also maintain and protect, which is slightly a higher and a better bar than contributing. A new development is not a blessing necessarily and will disturb the surrounding environment, positive or negative, and usually comes with a footprint. It is, however, in our hands to make sure that the development actually maintains and protects what is already there, not just passively, pass passively contributing to it. Therefore, we seek an amendment to this objective to say future subdivision and development play a key role in improving water quality and they support protecting and enhancing freshwater values by recognizing 
and better wording even exercising and implementing mana whenua values and their relationship to water, which is te mana, te mana o te wai. Um, and with this, I'm concluding my oral submission and more than happy to take your part. Ngā mihi nui. Question four, can you want to go first? Uh, kia ora, Ms. Uh, Octim Lewis. Ngā mihi nui kia koe, a moto korero. He turi ngā patai um, i nā nei. Te kaupapa o papakai. Um, we heard from the 30 to 42A report writer that there were a number of hui, um, up to 100, I think he said, in the development, and you mentioned in your submission, um, co-design is really important. Um, if it's um, if proper crying is important, and there were the opportunities leading up to this plan to be developed for input, um, why was proper crying not addressed in the development of the plan to a level that would allow them to allow Papa Kainga to be included as a chapter? Um, I think my understanding was it was, um, <coughs> but the officer's opinion, <laughs> my understanding was that the other chapters will enable those sorts of proposals. And I think there wasn't any further work done. So that's my understanding. But obviously Papa Kainga is not just a residential activity. So um, what Uncle Kahu and Uncle Hep said about, you know, uh, not knowing how the Maori way of living. So it's not about building a building. It's got commercial, educational, all sorts of different, different activities that is not just about building a building. So I think it was assumed potentially by, um, by the people who were working on it that that the bottom line would enable it that the you know residential zone and other zone provisions but i'm not sure whether that was sort of uh, that information was available to them it's actually not just about a residential purposes to build a papakainga and i think that the fact that that papakainga design guide was suggested um and um and developed also might have contributed to that because they might they might have maybe said in their head oh, we've got a papakainga design guide and rule rule framework in the current proposed plan, you know, are enabling that to happen. So what could possibly go wrong? But the but the fact that this Papa Kainga is a Taonga chapter and um and it should be written by Iwi for Iwi is obviously it's not going to be like enough for a residential rules to, to provide for for such such chapter. Yeah. That answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I, I got, I'm just confused because when we questioned the 42 report writer um, his view was that in the, all of those meetings that Papa Kainga never came up, uh, but we're hearing um, di different. We can get, we, we can sort out. Because I agree with you, I, and and I and I and I personally see it as a gap um, in the plan. But um, look, we don't need to explore that any further. I've heard um, what you had to say yeah. um, earlier. Heritage New Zealand, um, Pohere Tonga, um, indicated in their um, evidence that there was opposition from Ngati Tor to change the definition of wahi tupuna and wahi tap. Uh, can you explain to me what, why you were opposed to that general definition? So um, the the mahi that we found with the council on those definitions, it was done with our uncles and aunties and it was done with our whomatua. So they were happy with those definitions and we didn't want Heritage New Zealand Act or Heritage New Zealand expertise to, to define what we think Wahi Tupuna is. So I think that's the genesis of what you're asking. Yeah. Good point. And yeah. it might be, it might, you know, uh, it might be, they might be sort of overlapping, they might be similar, but I guess that the point was that it, it is the sort of the um their perspective of, ah, oh, they should be able to provide those definitions, which is absolutely not true. Or, mm. you know, shouldn't be that way at all. Like, we don't have to follow Heritage New Zealand's definition on things, although they, you know, they might be being correct or incorrect is beside the point. I think Mana Whenua already worked on those things, and I think, yeah, that was the point that we were trying to make. Oh, boy. Um, I said I had three questions, so in my last, uh, my last I suppose is the the submission provided what I term very generic relief, um, and it's it's useful if we get given or provided with specific wording and tools to be able to consider whether that's appropriate or not. 
Um, uh, do you and do you see any opportunity for that type of specificity? It's to flash a kupu for me this early in the day. Specificity um, to assist us in our um, deliberations for any changes that we may consider um, appropriate. Um, yeah, we're more than happy to work with the with the officers and subject matter experts to to see what those proposals are. Yeah, absolutely. I don't see why not. Yeah. I lied about three. I've got a follow on one. Just uh, just coming back to the proper kainga. So how would you anticipate the practicality of that rolling out? So there would be a conversation and then a plan change in the future. That's right. Yep. Yep. Just a final mihi to you all for taking the time to come um, to talk to us today. Um, just on to follow on a little bit from the papakainga. Um, I, I understand you you want to be able to develop the provisions to go into the plan, and I guess I'm I'm concerned about the gap in the plan today, and the time it may take to develop those provisions, go through a plan change, and have them operative. I just wondered if you'd had any thought. Uh, is there is there a, an interim solution or an interim band aid, if you like, that um, you know could help that? Have you put any thought to that? Yep, absolutely. So um, I think any of those sort of chapter developments, um, yep, understood. They're very long processes, uh, and also um, our Manafino partners also need to, you know, be up come to up to speed and I would like how they would like to proceed with that. Absolutely. But I think um, uh, we have done this process with Kapiti Coast very not very long ago. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a great chapter already written in the Kapiti Coast District Plan and it's just passed it, the plan change process. And since um, we've been you know, doing a lot of mahi for that and we're happy with that chapter, we can suggest that they could get inspiration from that written chapter. It's your base to yeah. work from. Oh, yeah. that's 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 really good. Yeah. So, um, so they won't be reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Early. Yeah. So you've got a you're already up the ladder when you're starting. Yeah. yeah. We've already. Yeah. And um, my understanding is also Upper Huts is also using the exact same chapter for their plan change, so that to make sure that there is a Papahoma chapter in their plan change uh, process. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'd love a copy of your speaking notes if sure. you don't mind, just just at some stage if you could email them through. But I'm just going to talk generally here about the objectives you, you talked about. Um, I'm not going to label anyone in particular because you're talking very fast, but um, I guess my overall impression was you felt like uh, the individual objectives should be, um, they should have more of a uh, be more specific to Māori. Every objective should have um, a specific component in terms of how it may or may not affect Māori or your aspirations for that particular kaupapa. Is that well, is that a correct assumption of what you were saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it comes through quite strongly with uh, the resilience mm. and cultural well-being and cultural resilience. They seem like they're a phrase, you know, that I'm using, but actually they're very nuanced and quite, quite important how we see those uh, phrases in different chapters. And when I look at, you know, things like urban form and development, they're all lumped up in the in urban form and development, which, you know, reads like as it's sort of just for Pākehā, but actually those worlds of views are quite different. And I mean, we have seen this recently with all of the events happening in the in the north at the Cyclone Gabrielle, uh, you know, and these cultural resilience is a big thing and it's going to be a big thing for our people, uh, especially in Porirua. But as it relates to Whanganui Atara as well, I think um, we need to make sure that a district plan, which is a, as the major document that governs the land use, needs to include those things. And it should be also a bar where people, when they're, you know, assessing the consent applications, they need to not only take account of it, but actually be able to follow a process how this is going to work for Mana Penua. Um, so that brings in the issue of um, Māori 
the word Māori, mm. when you said Māori, what is that? So you've got now already, it's mana whenua, tangata whenua, ngāti toa, te ati awa, all our iwi that have mana whenua here have been accepting our iwi from other tribes from the time our city started to be born. Um, it's nothing new to us. So you need to get some definitions and understandings yourselves about what those different types of category are, because that's partly what the reason why we're here, is the lack of that understanding. So, um, yeah. Do I say that right? Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I know, I understand that. Um, I, yeah, so I apologise if I'm saying things wrong. Um, okay. Being a bit too general, I'm being a bit too general, but I'm, I'm just trying to be up the, the high level, if you like. Um, uh, so my, my follow on from that was, um, you know, we've, we've been told that there are objectives that are specific to aspirations of Ngāti Toa, and and that all the objectives are to be read, you know, together. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how would you respond to that? Yes, yeah, see, that's like I think that's why I think I specifically kind of talked about the 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 te tayo Maori one. For instance, we 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 worked with the coordinator to provide those principles, and we're like, I'm very happy to see them in there. But you know, strategic objectives are objectives. They they are a slippery slope. Like, you know, when a consent application comes through, if they're not anchored with rules, there, there is a gap between, you know, what an objective says and what it needs to be done. Whereas for us, and when we write that objective, we go like, okay, this must be implemented. But for an applicant or, a, you know, or for a developer or whoever it might be, there's always an interpretation and they will just do the bottom line. So, and we, we've seen that in many, many examples. So I think, for the objectives, um, you know, we can craft them, but we they really need to be anchored in the rules, which is the doing, doing the doing. And um, and at the moment, like we can only suggest in the strategic objectives that you know they can be improved in the wording so that they're very clear. And then the consent uh, planner doesn't go, oh, what does that mean? Or oh, how do we? Um, and I think that's why objective writing needs to be really clear and upfront and giving you the steps of the process rather than giving really fuzzy feelings of <laughs> we, we're going to do this. This is very nice. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. I think, uh, yeah, it's the communication and what it, what it means and the doing. Um, and, um, and as a practitioner, I've seen the letter, like because the objectives are always sometimes nice to have when especially then they're very fuzzily crafted. Um, so I would be yeah, worried about in some of these objectives if they're not really anchored in the other chapters of the of the plan and the rules. Probably one of the most important cope up at the moment, the Maori do proper kind of development. Mm. Don't have much to you finish. Today I've got obviously to say uh, it is absolutely every Iwi's objective to make sure that they get these things recognised in all the PDPs throughout the country. So, in fact, I'd be thinking the optics for your public and everyone else, if you didn't have a section, particularly to mm. Papakaina, to be enabling of Papakaina developments. Well, can you be? Just, so just, just sorry to harp on about this, because this is important. This is what this, this hearing is about. So, um, I mean, you, you indicated earlier to Commissioner Faulkner that you would be happy to work with um, officer staff to, to 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 get your correct wording that you'd like, um, and that's that's what we need to see. Yeah, yeah. and I've, I've suggested some of them in my yeah. speech already. Yeah, so that's very so, targeted. So, and, yeah. so that we've yeah. got that to go from. That's probably what we need to see. Is we need to see what you would like, what you would like written, and those objectives that you'd like changed. Um, yeah, that's what we need to see. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no, I can provide them. Um, and happy to happy to work with the officers. Thank you. Um, 
Um, kia ora. I've, I've just got a couple of really detailed questions. Um, one is um, just having a look at your submission and um, you're wanting amendments to AW03. Yep. OK, um, I think from I don't think there's any change recommended from the officers, but it looks very similar wording to what is in the plan already in terms of your relief you've suggested. Um, if there is another rounding back to the officers, we can perhaps have a, have a look at that one in particular because I think it's pretty much the same as what you had suggested in your submission. The and other one. New wording. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the existing wording of AW03 is what you have in your relief. It might be one word. That's the one word that I suggested is not, uh, that can not to be used. Because at the moment, like it sounds like that we're asking permission oh, to okay. make yes. that, and that's a big amendment that we want. Oh, we want that amendment to be um, done because it's, it's, it's at the moment it's a weak wording of the district plan. Ah, right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's clarified yeah. in my yeah. mind. Because it's not a can. We we will exercise our Kaitiaki Sanga roles, and if the if if their intention was to mean something else, then it needs to be also corrected because it's not clear at the moment. Right, and right. it won't be clear to the officer who's also processing your consent. OK, I can see how it happened. Yeah. I, I didn't see the strike through of the can. Yeah, so that's right. It's perfect now. Yeah, okay. um, the other one was in relation to NEO2, natural environment, um, where the officer has recommended some changes to that, which without doing a complete look at the differences between the two is very similar to what you suggested. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering whether you had any views whether that goes to Again, goes to the extent you think it needs to? Yeah, it does. So you're talking about the any EO2? Yes. Because that is also a very weak wording. We don't want future subdivision development just to contribute. We would like them to actively actually change how they're doing things. There's actually a big difference and also See, you know, earlier I mentioned about the, you know, fuzzy, fuzzy objective writing. That's yes. one of them. That's a really good example. Contributes. What does that mean? What exactly does that mean? And also, and also because it's not clear to the developer or a consent applicant, they won't do anything about it. And we're putting all of the burden on them to understand it. So right. I think uh, that stuff needs to be also amended, which I also suggested some wording but happy to work with the officers again. Yeah, there, there, there has been some additional wording proposed by the officers but it still does um, have the concept of contributing to an improvement of the quality and I see your track changes um, uh, re re removes that particular section from yeah. the objective. Yeah. Okay, now that's very clear. And also like putting a higher bar than contributing. Yeah. Yeah, because um, they're, they're, they're they're disturbing the Finwa and yeah. and so they shouldn't just be contributing. They they should improve or you know yeah maintain whatever they yeah. Okay, no, that, that's understood. Um, I'm just sort of interested in the mechanics how mm. this might the the suggested changes, particularly if you're going to be having another talk to the council officers about about this because um, we, we're at strategic directions level at the moment mm -hmm. then there's a whole lot of more detailed hearings after this mm -hmm. um, it, and we'll be expecting a, a right of reply from the officers in terms of what they're hearing. Um, I believe the officers are, are listening into this as, as we speak but they're, they're not here today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just it's, probably through through the chair, which might need just a process so we can get your contributions um, to the officers and you have that discussion before their right of reply, which I think is likely to be fairly rapidly after the end of the hearing. So, yeah, I'm saying right Are they asking us to, to, uh, uh, to have more generosity again. <laughs> We're going to be more and, 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 and no. OK, OK. Once again, ask to be generous and help you out with your regulatory time frame for the bigger cause. That's what I'm feeling. OK. 
up on it. Sort of. The same. Just got one last um, last question. Can, um, it's still unclear to me. It's a bit ambiguous, uh, Mr. Ropata. Uh, what the meaning of mana fino is? Can you explain it? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> oh, and I just wanted to um, maybe to uh, translate it too for the great job uh, that he did during the uh, early part of this uh, period. Yeah. <coughs> I think that's it from us. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. Oh, he did. Why would he shout for lunch? Absolutely. He's always shouting for lunch. Always shouting. <laughs> I don't say say boy. I don't say say. With the chain. As soon as we've I'm broken up early, is it possible we can have a picture? Just
Resume the hearing. Thank you. Uh, Yeah. Yep. We have looked over. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You just need someone younger than 40. <laughs> I can do that. Atena Peta Katoa, Na Fakumi Honda, or the Kony Hua, Kony Hida, or Kornigi. We've already introduced ourselves. Um, at the Pōhiri Pipitea, so I won't waste time because uh, I know time is important. Um, uh, I wanted to begin today um, Talking to the, the beginnings of of Te Atiawa. and um, I'm going to work through a number of. So I'm just going to repeat here, Jazz. I think I might stop. I want to stop this. Um, Te Atiawa actually uh, originates from, from Tamarau uh, and Rongo Uero. And uh, this particular, particular um, kōrero here is actually uh, talks to our beginnings. And essentially, Tamarau was a deity from, from high above in the heavens and uh, then came across Rongo Uero, who was in the stream after giving birth. Uh, at the particular time, or not, not, um, not too far away from in the last day or two, or week even, uh, he he liked the look of it all, and uh, and there started the the uh, the tribe, if you like, or the whakapapa for Awanui Arangi, and from Awanui Arangi came Te Atiawa. So long story short, um, and I just wanted to now just take you through uh, a series of slides that. That will take us from his, history, if you like, and how we came to be here today in 2023. Um, that's for Te and Tabnaki Whanui. Uh, I will go through um, our tribal boundary, um, our status as Ahika, Tangata Whenua, and what that means in terms of this, this new uh, jargon around mana whenua. Um, we'll talk to our marae, our urupa, uh, we'll talk to um, our 2040 strategy as Taranaki Whanui Kitu Kukotika. Uh, we'll also talk to the Wellington City Council Takai Hiri and the Tupiki Order strategy that we have as an iwi entity with, with the council. And then in the sort of final moments, we'll be talking to the resource management issues that I've raised in, in, the, uh, in the letter to the commission, to the hearing, and and we should have plenty of time for some space at the end for, for any questions. So, um, Ngā iwi o Tokumaru, uh, Ngā te tama, Ngā te mutunga, Ngā te maru, Wharanui, and Te Atiawa all, all come off uh, Tokumaru Waka. And that's that northern, northern end of, of Taranaki. We have very, very close relationships with our Ngā te tō cousins, extremely close. And there was, there's no, there's no, um, uh, it's not a coincidence that we travel together and migrated from Tafia, northern Taranaki, and made our way down to Taihauaru to, to Kapiti, Purirua, and Wellington, and across to Tatawihu in the south. Um, uh, I'm, I'm snapshotting here, and these are the areas of occupation in 1820, and this is basically, as you can see, 
the uh, if you like the the crosses there represent Ngāti Ira, who who were here and at, at that time, and also uh, sub tribes of Hapu and Iwi of, of Ngāti Kahumuni were also also around. Uh, this is this is a real overview snapshot, and this takes you back to the to the musket wars, and the musket wars, and and um, you know began in the 1800s and moved through. Uh, Ngāpuhi, of course, were um, demonstrating their power and took out a lot of revenge and and uh, utu, if you like, across Bini Iwi, across the Motu. Um, and you know they moved into into Tamaki. They moved across to the to the Coromandel, to Hodaki, into the Waikato. They moved down the uh, Bay of Plenty. They went around East Cape into Ngati Paro, into Rungomai Wahine, into Ngati Kahunganu. And and the musket wars really started to make some shifts and changes within that whole iwi landscape, tribal landscape within New Zealand. Um, and of course, um, another big player in, at the time was Waikato Tainui. And Waikato Tainui, um, you know, was having having um, issues and relationships with, uh, poor relationships, shall we say, with Ngāti, with Ngāti Tor cousins. And, um, and you'll see those big, big arrows that are coming down from, from Kāwhia all the way down to Kāpiti. You'll see these big arrows coming from Taranaki all the way down to Kapiti and also uh, into Te Whanganui Atara, Te Upokoteeka. Um, you'll notice there in the in the uh, legend there, uh, you've got um, colours that um, demonstrate uh, expansion. You've got colours there that demonstrate retreat and migration, and the grey is no change. So uh, Te Whare Tō didn't, didn't get too much, uh, too much of a tickle up at all. Some iwi uh, in the lower North Island did, and they suffered. They suffered badly, and they did suffer at the hands of uh, ourselves and uh, our cousins Ngāti Tō, uh, as was the way in the day as conquering tribes. So I just wanted to just just show you the migrations and how things were moving, um, and uh, it was really just um, you know you're squeezing the balloon and it pops out somewhere else. So. Um, that's what you call uh, economic pressure, I guess, tribal pressure. Here's, here's another another demonstration of the number of um, migrations that took place. And this this isn't all of them, but the, these are the main ones that can be recorded and recognised. Um, and these are both from Ngāti Tōa and, and Taranaki. Uh, so you can see there, um, you know, huge shifts. Again, uh, another one there. This this includes this actually does break down the Ngati Tor, Ngati Rokoa, and the Taranaki tribes uh, migrations over various years. And um, you know, during those migrations, as I said earlier, um, some fared well and some didn't. Some did not fare well at all. You know, I'll probably talk to you know your Ngati Upper, uh, your Muopoko and your Rangitane tribes. Uh, we could also actually go across into the wider upper, where Te Atiawa actually uh, took over the wider upper for a period of time, um, uh, flexing their muscles there as well. Uh, that was Ngati Ngati Tama Ngati Mutanga and Te Atiawa. When I when I say Te Atiawa, I'm talking Atiawa Nui Tonu, and that that included Ngati Mutanga, Ngati Tama, and Te Atiawa. They were so closely related that you could throw a blanket over them. The, the whakapapa and the interrelationships, the whanauna tanga there was, was very, very strong. Um, by early 1835, you can see the change within, within Te Whanganui Atara, Te Upoko Te Eka. You can see at the top end right, uh, my right, your right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there. Uh, you can see there that um, uh, you've got Ngāti Rangatahi, which is a Wanganui uh, iwi or, or hapu um, and a Ngāti tō there, and you've also still got a bit of kahunuru there as well. So there's there's still there's still a lot of movement going on, uh, but what you will start to see is around the harbour, uh, Ngāti Mutunga, Taranaki iwi. Taranaki iwi is not just um, all the iwi. Taranaki iwi is, a, is its own iwi as well. There's a it's a bit like Wellington Rugby and Wellington Rugby Club. That's a, a way to put it. Um, and and so forth. So you start to see this 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 um, 
transition from a Ngati Ida uh, uh, focused uh, iwi around around the harbour and around Wellington to a very much dominated by by uh, Te Atea and Taranaki. And you know, a few years later, just prior to or about the same time as the signing of the treaty, you do you certainly get it's it's it is all Atiawa Nui Tony. Um, and what you'll also see, and obviously not in this, you will also see the migration as they've come down from Taranaki and uh, Kafia. Um, you you will start to see these these uh, migrations, and I'll call them extensions of migrations, as they as they came down to Kapiti, um, Waikanae, um, to into Wellington, uh, and across across to Tatauhu into the south. Into your into your white colours, into your Pictons, across to your Nelson, and even as far as as the west coast. So there was a real real movement uh, going on at the time, uh, and they were certainly um, looking for a place to um, establish themselves. As an example, and I used the wider upper uh, example before, uh, where. Um, an example there where uh, Te Pauri Pauri, Huniana Te Puna, Te Puni and Ngātati Tarangi, or Wetsako, which one where, where it was, they they went over and conquered the Wairarapa. So they were over in the Wairarapa. Um, Te Pauri Pauri's uh, wife and uh, daughter were, were taken hostage during the skirmish. Uh, the Kahungunu had actually been pushed way back to Mahia. And then they came back with a vengeance and certainly took on Te Whare Pauri while he was actually building canoes. Took his wife and, and daughter and um, took them hostage back to Mahia. Um, whilst this was going on, he wanted his, his family back, of course, so they negotiated. And the negotiation basically was that, oh, between uh, two Te Pakihirangi and Te Whare Pauri is that um, the waters that run east will be mine and the waters that run west will be yours and they agreed they agreed on the see that nice line that runs up here they agreed that would be the, the eastern boundary for Te Atiawa and Kahunganu yeah. uh, otherwise otherwise Te Atiawa was coming way over into into sorry not this one but over into the wider upper so um all happening very quick in those days um and that is that is the uh the most eastern boundary for uh te uh, in terms of in terms of ahika tangata whenua mana whenua uh ahika does give you mana over your own whenua uh we don't need to have mana whenua but for us as atiawa uh we have our three marae we have our urupa we have our, our moana, we have our harbour, our, our rivers, our streams, and also our lakes. And, um, you know, we, we, we do hold yahika status here. And, you know, other tribes will come in and say, you know, we've got other, these little bits and things. Absolutely. And uh, as, as Te Atiawa did, as they came through various places on the migrations too. But for us, we know where home is, and that's, this is, the, this is our lot here. Uh, we're not, we're not here to, to impress or uh, expand our, if you like, our, our tribal boundary. We're quite clear about where our tribal boundary starts and finishes, and uh, we have our marae here to, to prove it. Um, in terms of where we get to today, in terms of uh, settlement process, and 2008 was the year that we went through our settlement uh, with our uh, uh, Taranaki Whanui Kitupoko Teika, so at the time, there was three marais. We had our Runanga and we had Wellington Tents, the Palms North Reserves. And then the process, the settlement process was going through with the Waitangi Tribunal. And then lo and behold, we get a uh, PSGE, which is, which is ourselves, who I'm standing for today. Um, trustees, uh, our current trustees, you may or may not know some of them, but um, I think it's appropriate that I, I put them up there as, as our iwi leaders. Uh, you may be familiar with Kara Pukatapi Dentist, who's our chair. Uh, he's also um, holds an executive role at uh, Hutsuri Council. Others in here you may know. Um, 
if you maybe it might be someone like Fadi uh, Wano, who's actually in Taraki. So most some of our trustees are here in Wellington. They're also abroad uh, across the water as well. Um, I wanted to just touch base on our strategy. And I recently finished this uh, late last year, and we we did our engagement series with our people, and we've we've put our strategy right up to 2040. And the reason for that is actually to align it with 1840 and the signing of the treaty. And of course, around the same time, we have you know uh, the sale of of Wellington, uh, land changes and transfers and purchases, sales in that 1839-1840 period. So a 200 year milestone for the city is, yeah, I think is very appropriate. Um, our vision is our whenua, our moana, our awa, our, our uri, our people. And um, you could probably you could probably throw a blanket over every other iwi with a similar similar strategy. You've probably come across it before. Uh, this is no different. You know, we have guiding principles that actually will, will guide us through how we're going to achieve these things, our strategic goals and our strategic priorities. And our strategic priorities are around the taiao, our environment. Uh, they're around the uh, oranga, our, our, our health, health if you like. It's oranga or tafana is not just about health of the person, it's health of, it's housing, it's, it's everything that goes with that. Uh, te mata ura ura me te is very much a, a, a Taranaki dialect that talks to our language, our tikanga, our kawa. And we carry that, we carry that from, from Taranaki. Ngāra Wauti Apopo is really around um, economics and our commercial opportunities. Uh, again, just um, uh, working through those. So, so our strategic goals. When you when you line up, align our strategic goals with Wellington City Council, they are almost line for line. But they're 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 described slightly differently, but actually the outcomes are actually the same. Um, when we when we talk to the objectives, when we talk to the objectives um, and the outcomes, uh, we might we might say they're described differently. Um, the outcomes we we all agree on, but we've we've just recently in April uh, last year signed up with a Takai Hiri, uh binding tightly, if you like, between ourselves, um, Tarunanga or Tiatiawa, which is in the Hutt Valley, based in the Hutt Valley, but uh, also cover our boundaries, and Ngati Tor. And it's no, you know, it's and it's great. And and this 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 here represents represents that that binding tightly. And I brought it along deliberately because I, I wanted to actually actually demonstrate to you that we do actually have that. And um, uh, we have the Tafai heading, and we also have the Tupiki Order Action Plan, which is actually run run from from uh, Wellington City as well. So Nati Tor has one of these, and so does the Mayor. And the mayor has hers, um, so we're all paddling in the in the same direction. Um, in terms of resource management issues, uh, recognising the relationship of Tangata Fina with their lands and traditions, uh, you know we have a narrative around Tupo Vorunuku and Tupo Vorurangi. And this goes right back to the creation of the harbour. That's how far back our, our waka papa wants to go, does go back to. And um, it, it, it supersedes anything that comes comes after that. Um, and there's a corridor around that, and that is something that we're actually very active in terms of uh, promoting the narrative there. Um, I've talked to you about the ahi ka. You know, we do have an expectation. I certainly have an expectation that we're going to be part of Wellington City Council. My 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 vision in the future is that actually Te Atiawa Tanaki Whanui will actually be based within the Wellington City Council buildings. That's how close I want the the, the bindings on the walker, if you like, to be tight, so tight that we are right there with Wellington City Council. We, you know, our rangatira, our tino rangatira tanga in terms of strategic direction, guiding, and decision making is is absolutely there. We are at the table. And we're seeing that now with the Wellington City Council. We have our every representation. We have our our, our Maori ward, and our our aspirations. Actually, it's the same for Nancy Tour. We want more of our people at that table. Um, when we talk to Kaitiaki Tanga, you know we are active in our own city, not just here. 
but with our other with our other two um, local councils in Upper Hutt and uh, Hutt City, but also the regional council. Um, you know, we we are already doing we are already involved in co-governance. It's it's to us this this is this co-governance isn't new. We've been doing it for a long time. We've been in partnership. Um, I don't know, but more so now. It's it's more obvious these days. Um, and again, you know, when it came to um, my third point there under Kaitakitanga around the the Parliament occupying occup occupation, we were right in there. It was us. It's on our land. It's in our whenua. It's our takiwa. We helped lead lead that out. You know, we were talking with Wellington City, with the Parliament, with with police, daily basis. Te kahu o te um, tells us about peace and goodwill to man, and uh, and that's what actually helped to break down that occupation. It wasn't through legislation. So when I talk about Ahika, I'm talking we are there at the table, not just with Wellington City Council, but other Crown agencies as well. Uh, just touching on the establishment of Maori purpose zones. Um, it is unfortunate that actually our power in Kainga and other Urupa are, are not existent. They, they don't exist any longer. They're covered by these big buildings, roads, um, bridges, and all sorts of different things. So, so for us, having having that opportunity through that district plan to be across our city is absolutely vital. Because if we don't do it now, in 100, 200, 300 years, you 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 won't have it. We must have that here. Absolutely, absolutely vital. And that's not just around Wahi Tapu or par sites and and other 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 areas of interest or significant sites of interest. It's it's actually our meta, it's our real and it's our tikanga. That that needs it has to be here. It's it, it's got to be part of of Wellington City Council and everything that you know. When people want to look up something in the plan, there there it is. That's what you need to. That's what you need to follow. And and, and we need to be strongly uh, represented in the in that plan. In terms of multi purpose zones, and I've just picked out one here around Papakaina, and you'll see some stuff that we've been doing. Um, you know, we're now in a we're now in communities where we're we you know we, we're gonna we're gonna look like bloody Coronation Street shortly, and we're gonna you know we need to have these Papakaina areas where people can actually communicate. They know who their neighbours are. They're sharing. They're sharing kai. They're, they're actually making decisions within their papa kainga. Very important. Um, I call it the we as part of our settlement in 2008. In 2008, um, you know, we were. We had something like. I think it's 1800, oh, it was 1800 properties as part of an RFR process. I call it the rights of uh, fourth refusal because by the time we get it as Ewe, it's been through three or four other hands. So, for example, I don't know, if New Zealand police decided they didn't want a particular property, they throw it in the pool of all other Crown agencies across the Motu, and they, you know, if it does come out the, come out the end of the, um, of the pool and it's made available, it's probably not that not that greater uh, a property anyway. Uh, dare I say it? Oh, no, I won't point to a particular place across across the harbour. We'll get into a different story, but <laughs> um, and uh, people might not appreciate that. But essentially, when we when we're offered that property, we had twenty days to operate. Twenty days to do due diligence, get the debt funding. Me to me to me a business case. Now, it's highly, but no, that is that is very likely. But of course, we we can't put our hand on a heart and say that couldn't we get that done in 20 days? You know, I've done business cases for commercial businesses, and there's no way you can get that done in 20 days. So in other other words, in terms of a treaty partnership, there's no way we can realise those 1,800 properties, not within those timeframes, unless. unless some of you may may have been able to do that in the past, but the clock starts as soon as you register an interest. Now you've got 19 days. 
So I guess for us um, in this particular one, especially around the Papa Kainga piece, is how do we as iwi follow what the Crown has put in front of us, knowing fully well we're never going to make it. And that's our settlement process. We never, I'm, I'm being realistic, we're probably never going to realise our, our settlement, which is a big piece of our settlement. So this district plan has to recognise that and make that so those channels need to be open for our, our people and our entity to be able to go in there and make that work. Especially around Papa Koinga, we're talking about people who don't have homes. It's it's if if we don't open up that opportunity through that district plan for Ewe to be in that in that place. Um, I talked about co-governance and our primacy. I always talk to the three P's: primacy, prominence, and presence. We have primacy. We have primacy in this in this district. We have prominence because we're we're located here, and um, and we have presence because again our marae, our urupa, our mita, our kawa is followed here. But in terms of co-governance, we're already doing. Here's, here's three examples: Puni and the Puni Reserve, which is um, part of our settlement. We deal with Hutt City Council. It's Benua and it's a pass site. Well, it, it was a, a former close to a very close to a former pass site. Matu, Mokopuna and Makaro are the three islands in the harbour. Um, and we have a governance with uh, Doc, goes very well. In the Parangarahu Lakes um, with uh, Greater Wellington, we have two lakes and we have an extremely successful governance board there. There's three. Um, what we'd like to see more of is, is, is those, uh, the same, the same uh, approach with Wellington City Council. Uh, here's some very, very quickly. Um, uh, what we've been doing in terms of um, housing. This is in uh, this is in Wainui Amata, and this is a Papakaina. So this has uh, 30, 30 homes and units. Um, the ones the ones above are um, three bedroom brand new homes in a Papakaina setting. They're all owned by our people, all of them. And they're all well below market value. You could probably say, I think the average for there is 534k is the average price. And that was at a time when um, the market was going through the roof. Uh, the ones in the down below in the black, they're actually all set up for Komatua. And if you look carefully, you can see some timber uh, between the timber. There's some gardens there anyway. So the side of that is Kohangaru, which has 80 to 100 kids in it. So that's 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 Papa Kainga. So that's the future. Uh, again, some more shots around the Taiao, uh, Jobs for Nature, our uh, Parangarahu Lakes Board, and some of the events that we put on. Um, Co-governance. We're very heavily um, uh, engaged with Waka Kotahi. Um, and actually, we have a representative from uh, Ngāti Tō that sits with us as well. Um, and she happens to be Te Atiawa and Ngāti Tō. You'll find with Ngāti Tō, half of them uh, have a Atiawa Nui Tōnu Whakapapa, and you'll find with Atiawa <laughs> have a Ngāti Tō Whakapapa, or, uh, or a bit of Raukawa, or a bit of, um, you know, Koata or Rārua. So the Whakapapa links here are very close. So when we talk about each other, it's, it's, it's all good. Um, so we're, we're heavily in, involved with the alliances. Um, we're also in Riverlink. We're probably overseen with in our Manafino steering group, one uh, one point three billion dollars worth of of project work in this city. Let's get Wellington moving. Who knows where that'll end up? And of course, Kiwi Rail, which is expected to be at least half a billion dollars, and that's also tying in with Tatawehu as well. Some photos there. There's the former mayor, uh, alongside Waka Kotahi representatives and Hutt City Council, oh, and the minister, Riverlink, Tupohoronuku, which is a cycle trail resilience project. Um, 
So, yeah, um, again, Tarkai here, they're bound tightly together. Bound tight together tightly. Uh, the three Ps I've spoken to around primacy, prominence, and presence. For, for, for us, or for me, it's a bit around about equity. And uh, it's hard to, to balance up equity, of course, where, where things are at the moment. All our, all our statistics are all going the wrong way, but improving slightly. Um, we've got a, a wee way to go, and that's not just us. That's, that's right across the whole motu. Um, but to be able to do that, it has to be done at this level, uh, in the district plans, in the regional management plans, um, where we could help make decisions. And um, that's that that has you know we haven't been engaged as as iwi across the motu I don't believe closely enough with our councils. You'll know this more than I do, but I it, it really we really do, and I say. You know, I hope Nati Tor doesn't mind me saying this, but I'm sure they want to be heavily engaged in this too, and I know so. Helmut and Callum, I know so. And um, and we get on like a house on fire, and and you know we really want to put a match to this to this district plan stuff. So we we want to be in there. Um, when we talk to commonality and in, in our objectives, as I said, the alignment of strategic objectives between ourselves at Tiatiao and Tanaki Whanui, and Wellington City Council are so close. Um, and as I said, you know, the one thing that I'd really like to see, especially as the prominent iwi in this in this district, is I really would like to see, or actually I'll say I expect to see Te Atea or Taranaki Whanui embedded in that district plan. I really do. I'll say it right now because you're going to see me for the next 16 to 18 months, and I'm not going to be, you know, because if, if we're serious about having this treaty equity, partnership, tākai here, MOU, whatever your relationship, then iwi has to be in the district plan. There's no way you can, I was going to say a word then, you can, and it started with B and ended with T. There's no way, there's no way we cannot be written into that district plan. And I don't know how you do that because I'm not a planner. But from a leadership point of view, we have to be. So I hope, hope I've said that enough now. <laughs> and uh, and that's me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, uh, can you email, please email Coffee and I can do PowerPoint to Jazz. Oh, I'd like to go first. Uh, kia ora, Mr. Uh, just a couple of um, quick questions. Um, in the relief that you're seeking within the plan, um, you've um, sought the term primary mana whenua. Um, my understanding is you have mana or not. What what do you mean by primary? What what does primary mean in your eyes? Um, yeah, uh, pr primacy. Pr yeah, pr yeah, so so in your thing you've wanted. Um, Taranaki Whanui to be the primary mana whenua. Oh. What, what is, so what do you what do you mean by primary? What, is, what does that mean to you? Yeah, and, and without and, and and being sincere in my 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 response to that, it, it is saying and I've spoken to our ahika status. And it's not to say that uh, we don't have relationships with other iwi. Of course we do. Um, we have them with Kahunganu, Rangitane, Ngāti Tōa, especially, especially Ngāti Tōa. Uh, we're very, very close. But for us here in the harbour, we would like to see us recognised within that district plan as as the Ahika. It's not to say that we don't have, you know, uh, commercial or cultural um, issues or anything like that. Um, or maybe I'll go the other way. If if it was with Porirua City Council and and Ngati Tor, and Ngati Tor sought support from us, absolutely, absolutely, we would give them that support because they are that that's that's definitely um, and regardless of whether we've been through through that area or not, uh, we our boundary is is tied into our Tukiwa. Um, so we have the utmost respect for other iwi that are around us. Uh, we are guided by the principles um, that we that we set out through the Rokura. 
Um, but for this, for Wellington City Council especially, um, and Hutt City Council will get the same message, is we have the Ahikar status, we want to be the, the prominent iwi. And it's not to, to belittle any other iwi that are, are within, you know, there's lots of iwi. Um, uh, when I say iwi, lots of iwi members that live and reside within within Wellington City, within the, the Hutt Valley. But um, we, we, hold, we hold the, the colour and the tikanga. Kapoi, thank you for that. Um, an onahika. Uh, so in your relief, uh, you sought a um, definition of ahika, but you didn't provide one. So how would you how would you define ahika? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> to find it for us. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, give us the words. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll probably get someone to, to, to rewrite this because I'm, I'm, I know what I want. How it's written is, is not necessarily the right way. But ahika to me is, um, well, ahi meaning burning fires, the fires that are burning. Ka meaning um, burning forever, if you like. So the burning fires, and, and we see that with our, with our marae, and we, 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 we continue our... Uh, our cultural expression, our cultural kawa, our cultural tikanga, not just in the MRI, but actually right across our whole rohe, our whole takinga. <laughs> and that's and that's not just for us to to follow and appreciate. That's actually for everyone to follow and appreciate. Whether you're a council, whether you're um, a ministry. Yeah. So Ahika status, for example, when the uh, Ngati Mandia portal came down for their settlement uh, hearing last year, late last year. We welcomed them in through Pipitia. Yeah. And we had seven, seven, seven to eight hundred people sitting in our in Pipitia Marae. And uh, it was our, our kawa and tikanga that resided over, over that, over that iwi as they came in. Yeah. Is there, um, is it only Marae that give you ahika status? Is there any other way you can achieve ahika? Within a rohi? Um, no, I think there's. Uh, I think there would be several ways to 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 demonstrate to demonstrate ahika. Um, you know, using our harbour, going to our tauranga ika, um, collecting and harvesting kai, our rongoa. Um, there's there's several ways to to demonstrate that in terms of a cultural expression. Mm. Um, it doesn't just have to be marae or a pōhiri or a wakatau that, that expresses that. The fact that we, the, the mere fact that we can go out to wherever we want to go and uh, when we had uh, puanga, puanga is the pre precursor to matariki, so we expressed our, 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 um, our ceremonies of, of puanga as well as matariki. So, um, Topoi, and my last question is just clarification. Earlier you showed a picture of their papakainga development where you said there were about 580 or 500 odd thousand dollars to purchase. Who owns the whenua in that development? Oh, well, you know, in, in that particular case, um, in, in those particular titles, uh, our, our people do as individuals. So the person who buys the house buys the land as well? That's right, yeah. Come and uh, what we have in that in that particular model, um, you have a you have a piece of land obviously with a building on it, um, and we have uh, drawn into the, the sale and purchase if you like, is is if you are looking to to move on, it actually gets it actually gets offered back to the iwi, and for another for another person in the iwi to purchase it. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Birch. Uh, kia ora. Um, I just wanted to explore the papakainga a bit more. Um, you know, in your submission, you're um, critical of the plan, not addressing that. Um, we've had several conversations at, that the, the council are looking at doing that via a separate process, um, whereby they can perhaps have a bit more time to put the detail in and to work with iwi or iwi work with them to develop provisions of how that might, mm. might work. Um, I've sort of 
my concern was always that you know these things take a long time you know develop provisions um, to go through a plan change you know it takes a long time so I, do, I just wondered what what your thoughts were on that process yeah not not being a planner myself i'm not i'm not an expert in that in that space but uh in in my head and what i would envisage um and how that would operate under Wellington City Council would be a number of iwi uh, resources that would be in there. So um, again, collaboration um, around coming to a solution that actually works for Wellington City Council, uh, for the wider community, but also for iwi. Mm. And um, and I would be thinking, uh, you know, yeah paid resources to work alongside Wellington City Council and, and, and therefore it doesn't actually, uh, we, we're not we're not going, how does this look? And then back again, actually, we just put them all in the same room, working together. I mean, to, clearly you've got some good examples that you, you've you've achieved already. So you have some good um, ideas for where, where you want to go with other developments. So, you know, that's really valuable for the process. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and, and without, um, without sort of uh, being too cheeky, but um, we did really well, and that was actually in Wainui and Mata. And that went, you know, the first 30 went very well. Uh, we, we, we ran into issues, but they weren't to do with, <laughs> it was to do with EWI itself. So, um, but not the not the process of actually the building and things, it was, it was other stuff. Um, so anyway, um, just in terms of your rights of first refusal, I'm just not sure what you see the plan um, assisting in that process. I'm not sure I understand how you think the plan would assist. Yeah, I, where, where I where I where I think it, it will exist, and and I'm talking in a practical, pragmatic um, approach now, rather than the theory of the RFA, is that um, sure I did say 20 days. But where we need to push the crown is to say we well, just can't give us 20 days. It's just impossible. Mm. So I'm I'm making a, a really big assumption that there's some smart people in Parliament that will actually make some changes. And therefore um, those changes can be also be, be reflected within the district plan. So um, because to to leave them as they are is just just untenable. And my own my own view on on that. On that settlement and the acceptance of the RFRs was, I don't think they actually believed that they were going to really be given only 20 days to make to make use of a, of an opportunity. I don't I don't believe in in your wildest dreams that anyone would be stupid enough to sign up to that. To me, that was all in the fine print, and I think it was um, in bad taste. Uh, just one other question I had. Um... Was the Māori purpose zones that you brought up before, um, that's not something that's come before us. Um, those particular words, should I say, the concept has come before us, but not those particular words. So I just wondered, through the plan development, um, did you sort of signal that to Council about introducing those sorts of zones into the plan? Uh, probably not, no. Yeah, it's OK. But the idea is to be able to um, is is predominantly for Papa Kainga, or is it? Oh, I, I I won't say predominantly for Papa Kainga because I don't know what the future is going to hold, and I don't want to mm. I don't want to single something out and and then realise actually there were other other ways that the multi purpose zone could be useful. Um, what I, what I would like to see is, because to me, Papa Kainga, what you saw before was actually on front, you know, it was a horizontal Papa Kainga. I don't think we're heading that direction. We're heading in Papa Kainga. So, so what does that mean? And, and I'm not an urban developer. I, I, I'm not in design or anything like that, but I think we need to broaden, broaden our, our ideas, our aspirations, our, our, what we think the future holds um, to allow for it. And um, community wise, you know, as most of us know, some some of us probably don't even know who our neighbours are. And I think, you know, um, we hear that 
from some of the responses coming back from Napier and co, where actually it's the first time their neighbours all came out of their houses to actually help each other. So there's a pretty good there's a pretty good response to why papa kaiing is really important. So, but um, the Māori purpose zone is wider than just papa kaiinga. Yeah, I don't want to put a yeah. I I don't want to reference it because I there might be other people that come up with an idea of what you can use a Māori purpose zone for. Thank you. It's helpful. Any more proceed to the table? Go, okay, David. Um, um, kia ora. I'm going to be quite frank here, so um, excuse me. I, I just wonder, I mean, you've talked about um, that Te Aoua needs to be heavily embedded in the district plan. And um, we've heard that approach from other iwi. And I guess my question is, why does the plan need to differentiate between iwi? Um, is there an expectation that the plan will deliver on an iwi by iwi basis? Um, what, what happened to the concept of what's good for one iwi is good for all iwi? Well, that's simply not true. Tell me why. Well, it's it's like anything, right? You know, um, I may I may not have the same resources as 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 you as an iwi. Um, so you couldn't compare. Tanaki Whanui to say Ngaito, hmm. you just couldn't. So you're not on. You even even with the even with an iwi, you're not on a on a on a on a um a balanced uh, seesaw, if you like. There's not. You just can't compare them. Is it possible? Okay, I'm, I understand what you're saying. Is it possible that iwi are expecting? The district plan to deliver on things that it wasn't designed to do. I mean, the plan is 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 dealing with use of subdivision land, the subdivision of land, the use of land, and the protection of land. Um, how does that differentiate on an iwi basis? Well, I'll go. Back, I'll use Kahununu as an example. Now, there's probably names along that Kahunganu uh, in those areas. I'm sure, and I, I'm, I'm, I can't be sure, but I bet you there's names there that say that talk to an hour that floods floods often. Or I bet you there's an hour that's called I flood every hundred years. Don't don't live here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Now I'm not taking. I'm you know I'm not I'm not taking anything away from those poor people in in in, in Kahunganu and Napier. Not at all. What you what you're speaking to there uh, is provisions in the plan that fall under the heading of plan making. The making of the provisions, whether they're objectives, policies, rules, zones. The plan also has a another role in terms of the use of resources under that plan making framework, and it's that latter role. I, I don't certainly don't deny the differentiation in terms of plan making. But in terms of the actual implementation of the rules that are made, I'm, I'm just struggling to understand the, the desirability to have the plan deliver on an iwi by iwi basis. It's a pretty philosophical question. Yeah. Well, there's three councils in this in our in our Takiwa, and they're all going to get challenged the same. I guess you're all going to come back and ask us the same question, but the reality is, is is we want we want to have a say in our our area, whether it's Potiroa City Council, whether it's Hutt, whether it's here, whether it's um, Hastings District, or whether it's Napier. Um, and isn't isn't your mere presence today and the fact that you're a submitter going considerable way to having that say? Well, I, I think it's the first time that Taranaki Whanui has ever sat in on and engaged with with a district plan. Um, it probably, you know, this city has been developed and built with probably zero um, input from any iwi, whether it's ourselves, or cousins can't talk. Um, 
actually through the identification of sites of significance, which was done in the last district plan, which was a, done with Tiatia and actually Natara at that stage. That's this that was the extent of the plan. Okay, no, I appreciate your answers. Yeah, I, I'm not a I'm not a planner, so I'm 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 not in that position to sort of probably dive down into uh, the mechanics of it all. Oh, you go. Okay, I'm I'm gonna ask two stupid questions. So sorry. Um, so is Taranaki Fanui an emu as such, or is it a, a rock or a vehicle? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, no, good question. Um, in a cultural tribal sense, um, it would be no. Um, however, from the if you like, if you want to follow the uh, the crowns um, process where we were put into a post settlement governance entity, that's that it pulls in Atiawa, Atitama, Atiruanui, and all these various iwi and and sub tribes hapu that were here in 1840. So um, that's how they've that's how that's been set up. Yeah. Uh, the, the district plan would need to make that clear in terms of its reference. Any references? Uh, no. You think? Yeah. Well. Um, so Taranaki, um, if you like, is the uh, connection back to Taranaki. You mm -hmm. all are. All the all the iwi that that are that were here. You could say it's a bit like the 8020. It might be the 9010. So uh, Atiawa, as in Te Atiawa, uh, might have made up the 80 or 90. And then you had Ngati Tama, Ngati Mutanga, Ngati Ruanui, uh, and others, a couple of others that that were also present here at the signing. So they make up the other 10 or 20 percent. Um, so largely Te Atiawa. Um, Banui, meaning. Oh, oops. Meaning the whole. Yeah. Just one other, other question. The Tupikiora, does that include working with the council on a plan change in the future to not not off the top of my head. I, no, no. I think it's more down into um, some quite specifics. Uh, no reason why. <laughs> Just one um, clarification on an earlier question, Mr. Hunter. So the um, when I asked the question about um, is it only Marae that Kibahi came, and when you were saying that's it's kai gathering and other things, what, what I was meaning by that question is if you look at an iwi like Ngati Toa, they have land holdings here in Wellington. Where I was going with my question is does that give them through their land holdings and their place if you like in Wellington does that by default also give them a hika in the context of because because what I was why I was asking the question is it is it marae I wasn't meaning and I was meaning or can there be another mechanism <laughs> so so I just wanted to make it clear that um what 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 the what the question was is what what are the things that could be used as determinants to demonstrate or give rise to ahika and is is other land holding types or activities allow you to fit into their definition for want of a better term? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and oh look and and the conversations that we've had with Ngati Tour is our uh, and. You know, maybe I'm being a bit bold to say this, um, but I believe they they recognise us as as ahika, and um, uh, and yes, they they whether they'll purchase, whether they'll are you talking about purchase Benua, or purchase yeah, land yeah. or or all, all, all of the above, all of the yeah. Above. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would I would be thinking that our our relationship is strong. And um, as we as we re recognise their ahika status in Porirua, as we could potentially go and purchase land in in Porirua or Kapiti, 
and then say, well, actually, we have ahika status here too. So I think I think uh, re really it's about um, cultural, it's about tradition, it's about kawa and tikanga, that iwi set. Yeah. And um, I think it does get quite complex when the crown start to layer upon layer on various things, but I think so long as iwi themselves and their relationships are strong. I think I think the if you like the manner of Ijiwi um, can be carried along in that kopapa. And, and and look, we, we we have one at the moment. Well, we had one with around um, in Tapitaranga. Now we we can talk to that and keep that intact. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. And um, I just ask you to clarify, Mr. Hunter, um, the relationship between Ahika and Mana Whenua is, I've read that to be Mana Whenua, you must have Ahika. Uh, is that is that your position? Um, Ahika to me is the, is the most, uh, like if we had a, a high to low definition, I would say ahika is at the top. And by the sheer fact that you have ahika, means that you have mana whenua and you have tangata whenua. Um, I didn't actually know what mana whenua was until in recent years, because I thought we were all tangata whenua and those that actually lived here. You know, you can you can live in Australia and have mana whenua to here. But the mere fact is, is that you live in Australia. You might have whakapapa connections to Wellington. But you certainly don't have ahika. It might be it might be my brother. My brother has mana whenua. If we're using mana whenua as an example, he has mana whenua connections to here because he has whakapapa to here through Honiana to Puni into Wharipodi. But he certainly doesn't have ahika. And there is a difference. So, so your so your your answer is ahika gives you mana whenua, but you might be mana whenua without ahika. That's correct. And, and the critical point then is whether you can fuck a papa back. It, it's about it's about fuck a papa in in uh, in, in Wenua. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, any more for any more? That's great. Really appreciate your time, and uh, just want to repeat some words that I uh, made at the opening. And so thank you. You're welcome to Pipiti and Marae. We really appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. And I, you know, this is my first time speaking in in front of a panel or a hearing at all in my whole, you know, um, career. Uh, I think I think uh, you, you're all lovely people, and it was a it was a privilege to welcome you here to uh, to at Pipiti, and it's just lovely to um, to talk to you. Um, I guess we're going to be seeing a bit of each other <laughs> for the next year and a half or so. Well, so we'll look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to get uh, prepared for the next one now. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I might take a diploma in planning by the end of this. You'll be an expert, that's for sure. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. plan now is that we're going to hear uh, again once again from interpolate the council staff team what uh, you know where your colleague mr McCutcheon is uh, you can uh, come and retrieve him from the kitchen and we'll get underway <coughs> Uh, we've finished uh, uh, the one. Yeah. Right. Where are we? Up to? I'm sure you're going to remind us, Mr. Chair, where we're up to. Uh,
Oh, uh, that's very interesting. Oh, uh, well done. Put a sticker. Yes. This is uh, C. It's RCC. Safe traveling. Thank you. You don't take your paddle on the uh, <laughs> security <laughs> bike. Confiscate it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it to um to Gabriel. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we can uh, crack the rest of the 42A report in short order, gentlemen. Uh, we're up to 14.8 SSRC. Which one of you gentlemen is going to go first? What's this? Where do you want to go? Yep. This is. Where do you want to go? Oh, just how far did we get through? Uh, we had got to the end of SCA. That infrastructure, the, um, yes, we dealt with this SCA. So we finished that. Three SRCC. of wordings and uh, to that, which basically takes out the 2050 because within the time frame of the plan, there's only so, so much you can do. I, I, I wonder why you, why in there you've, you've it still remains as 2050. That's going off. You hadn't proposed any amendments to SRCC01, had you? Having a look at, my, at your um, Mr. Sapsford's uh, 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 argument was essentially that you could do nothing until 2049. Mm. So there is a change to SRCC. There is to SRCC. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, but okay. No, I've got it here. Um, so you're looking to get net zero emissions by 2050. Mr. Sapsford was, was looking at something which is perhaps more pertinent to the time frame of the plan as opposed to 2050. Mm. What, what's, what, what, what's the what's the reason why 2050 is in there? Can you remind me of that again? That, uh, uh, presumably aligns with a different council strategy. That's correct. So considered Mr. Sapson's view as well as that of the regional council who sought a uh, different time frame for uh, 2030. Um, but after considering those views, I uh, went with the 2050, um, which is, is, as you note, consistent with the Te Atakura strategy of council. So, is, how can the plan give effect to something which is such a long, it's a long way away, 2050? Opposed to within, say, a 10 year life of the plan. Uh, Don't you need to move towards those goals, make actions to move those, towards those goals mm -hmm. um, within the life of the plan? Because at the moment, your wording says achieving net zero emissions by 2050. So that it doesn't is correct. really give all that much sort of strategic direction about how that's going to happen. So I considered the regional council's point of view as well, which was around reducing it to towards that 2030 mark, and that was a 57% reduction. But 
I was considering at, at that high level, um, Te Atakura takes the, the broader approach of 50 years um, and the 2030 is a step along the way. So um, I didn't consider it necessary to include the 2030 and then the 2050. Mm. Um, I recognise that could be done though uh, as sort of like a step along the way to uh, achieving um, Te Atakura, the net zero emission uh, by 2050, which is the term and the, the phrasing that's used throughout the introduction of that chapter. So would an alternative way of doing it is, is um, assisting to achieve wider goals as opposed to achieving 2050? Well, I guess my, my concern is it is reliant on another another document, another strategy of council, which is all encompassing across all of their various activities of council. So you've got something which starts off as strategic achievement, which says cities build environment support achieving net zero emissions. The question is, how is it going to be done? And what levers the district plan actually does to do that? Whereas the, the an alternative, which is what uh, Mr. Satchel provided, was um, <coughs> looking towards the short term contributions, if you like. To achieving that wider outcome, mm. but in a, a, if you like in a more manageable chunk. To me at the moment, the, the way that it's written, it, it's sort of too far out. It doesn't mm. have any strategic direction about how that might be achieved. Rather, rather than a step change, uh, what about something that conveys the comment, uh, the concept of a progressive movement towards, i.e., that makes it clear that, that this doesn't doesn't permit doing nothing over the ten years of this plan, on the basis, well, it's so far away, it can look after itself. We'll worry about that in the 2030s, because that because that is a, an interpretation that's open mm. on this wording. I certainly think it could be revised to a more incremental approach, like without necessarily providing a a lockstep, but convey the the concept of continuous movement towards, and not even proportionate movement, but mm. but not nothing. And Mr. McCutcheon, if I can add to that, and a SCA01 might provide a, a model for that, where it, that new clause four talks about the contribution, and I, I and I notice we're talking about infrastructure contributing mm. to zero carbon and slightly different concept, I, I admit, but that concept of a, a progression along a, a time frame and spectrum might might be assisted by um, the wording in clause four. Food for thought. Thank you. Certainly, I think uh, looking at the sort of the qualifier at the start of the clause, so uh, SCO1 is in so that, um, and SRC CO1 talks about support. Yeah. It's sort of a um, not trying to do everything, but as, as one mechanism, we could look at that word. If you didn't have anything to balance of SRC, I had one on SRCC2, O2, um, really flowing out of centre ports. Submission. I'll just get it. Sure. Um, the is there an uh, is there a need? capture the situation where um, risks are low and stay low, but might be incrementally increasing. In other words, pose those as alternatives so that risk is not increasing or is reduced or, or remains low. Um, because you could have a very low risk currently and a 
very small increase would be contrary to this objective, but your, your risk remains low. So what's the problem? Now, I appreciate that in the coastal environment, there's a problem because the uh, NZCPS has a specific provision, but outside the coastal environment, like the centreport's problem is that they might still be stuck because of course they operate in the coastal environment, but um, but is there is there space to, to talk about low risk outside the uh, coastal environment as an option? So there could well be. Um, the objective isn't intended to be read exclusively to the coastal environment, rather more at that setting that high level approach for how does the plan manage natural hazards and um, the way in which the natural hazards chapter does that is it talks about when we're uh, setting out a framework for managing hazards and activities, we're not looking to increase the risk or we're trying to reduce it where possible. Um, I did have some sympathy for um, the uh, view of Centreport where they said the way it, the way in which it's uh, drafted now makes it sound like risk always has to be low and I certainly accept that risk won't always certainly be low um, for some of the um, activities that people might want to do and there, there will be a higher level of risk. Um, so I, I agreed with them that it would be um, uh, sensible to remove the clause that made it sound like risks always had to be low and then focus on the approach for which um, the chapter took, which was uh, looking to ensure that risk didn't increase or, or would be reduced. Um, but I can uh, take another look at uh, what you're suggesting. Yeah, well, I think that um, the, that's, a, that's something for you to, um, to ponder about. Yeah. Like I can understand your logic why you've moved away from the um, notified version, but it's more uh, have you lost the nuance that you might have an increase, but it, there isn't actually a material problem because the risk is still low. Just something you think about that. Can I just a quick sure. Um, Mr. McCutcheon, can you just help me with that third limb of SRCC02? What was the wording of the notified version? Because I can't really tell from the strikeouts. Is there a, uh, that's the are intolerable. What, what did it say? Avoided where risks are intolerable. The risks yep. are intolerable. So, it's, okay. So, there might have to be some further strikeouts. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, that, that would need corrected. Yeah, sorry, but pedantic matter, sorry. Um, and, and just in the same category of pedanticism, um, the SCRCC01, you, I think you meant to cross out net and the where it first appears on the first line. Oh, there are too many nets. Yes. <laughs> you, you, double nets. <laughs> you, you, you've captured it um, yes. elsewhere. Yeah. For that, if I can just put a line through net there. Good spot. Yeah. Hopefully I can contribute more to that as time goes on. <laughs> Uh, and the other final question I had on this section um, is um, in relation to 1099. Uh, the chapter is focused on resilience to the effects of natural hazard and climate change rather than resilience in an apt adaptability sense. So the, my question is, well, should it be by all should it also be focused on adaptability? Um, I'll have to pull up uh, Nati Toa's submission again, but I, from recollection that was to do with um, cultural resilience. And um, uh, from memory, the submission, I, I wasn't able to understand um, how it should be amended to. Well, that's a small technical hitch. Yeah, so from memory, that that's why I wasn't under, under, able to understand what amendments to that objective or the chapter would uh, 
be able to reflect cultural resilience. That's, yeah, because I too talks about adaptation. And yes, yes. I will be um, asked clarification of that this morning, so uh, I'm not sure if you were listening in, but they um, had some good direction about what that meant, but they were also going to provide some specific wording. Um, so, yeah. so uh, we emphasise the need for speed to get in in time for you to consider for your reply. So you may or you may be hearing from Nadi Khan. Uh, any more on SSRC? Yeah, I, I just have one and it's more uh, in your rebuttal statement in response to Brendan Liggett, your parent 32. Say definitions for different numbers of residential units increases risk. Disagree and consider this inherent when the resource consent process is required to be applied and the definitions are irrelevant. Um, well, I didn't know actually what you meant there. Um, why, why are definitions irrelevant when you come to a, a resource consent? I can clarify that statement. So in Mr Liggett's um, evidence, he said we don't want a definition of multi-unit activity. Yeah. Kaiangora had said that, and instead they wanted the term four or more residential units used as the consenting trigger. He said that it was increases risk when there is a definition of multi-unit activity in a plan. My point is that the risk is inherent whenever you require a resource consent for an activity. So. You could call it sort of what you want. If, if the resource consent is required for four or more units, that is greater risk than a permitted activity for three units, which is what. Well, so it's risk of getting consent as opposed to any other risk that there might be. Correct. That's correct. So your argument, your reasoning was it doesn't matter whether it's a definition that kicks you into a consent or a, a, a more specific rule. The end results the same. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Off to UFD. Um, Mr. McMahon, anything from you? Mr. Dash. Um, yep. Yeah, I've just got to get my head back in the game, actually. Try and find the. Uh, yeah. U UFD 02. Your amendments, proposed amendments to that. At strategic, at number four provides a mixture of land uses and, and activities in greenfield areas. I see you've got a rider on there where feasible, and I thought that there was a reluctance to put riders like that as a general principle in there because it needs somebody to assess the feasibility at a strategic directions level as opposed to being focused on an outcome, which is what I understood strategic directions to be. What's your comment to whether or not we feasible is in there? Um, feasible to who? Feasible to the council? Feasible to the developer? Um, who And how would that be assessed? Are you going to require some sort of feasibility assessment at resource consent stage for about why there is a mixed use or, or what are we actually getting at here? Mm. So and in including that qualifier, I turn my mind to, um, to the two examples of greenfield development, which do form part of this plan, um, that being uh, Lincolnshire Farm and the other one being in Upper Stebbings Glenside West. Now those two um, developments, um, while they are, they are greenfield developments, um, the Stebbings one does not include any mixed use of any real substance, so it doesn't have a local centre, uh, any community centres, that kind of um, mixture of uses, whereas the Lincolnshire Farm one does. Uh, it has a standalone centre, yeah. it has some industrial and, and mixed use land with it. In um, coming to um, the proposals in the Upper Stebbings um, development, um, there was quite a bit of uh, feasibility analysis that went on as to whether a centre could could go in there, um, and it was determined um, that uh, being close enough to the Churton Park one would be uh, provide all the facilities that would contribute to a well functioning urban environment. And I have some sympathy um, that it might not be in all um, 
cases uh, feasible to include uh, a mixture of uses, but that be something at a, at a high level to aspire uh, to including within the identified greenfield areas. Okay. Just wondering whether there'll be a different way to splice that. Mm. Instead of the where feasible is where uh, again we're looking at a rider if it was where practicable. Um, but if you could have a think about whether there's something which which provides the direction, but without any uh, and being certain about the and being certain about that direction without you know, putting a caveat on. I wonder if the answer might be something along the lines of capturing the stepping situation where uh, where those services, uh, unless those services are already provided uh, in the uh, in reasonable in the reasonable vicinity, something like that. Like that's poor language, but the concept. Pick up the concept. Mm. Not it's not whether it's feasible; it's whether it's needed. Like it would it would always be feasible, but is it sensible? Is it needed? So that it's those kind of considerations that you, mm. you seem to be looking at. Mm. Like I can understand the logic in that particular example. It's not needed because there's one already there that's close enough, and it would be and it would be stupid to try and replicate that. Mm. So, it, but but it's how you capture it. I don't think feasibility quite does it because I don't think that's what you mean. Okay. Like you call it feasibility analysis, but I'm, I'm, I don't think it's. I don't think that's what you mean. I so. turn my mind to that. Um, I had a question about the same, and I was reading all of this about urban development and identified greenfield areas, and I was thinking, do these considerations not apply in brownfield areas? And if not, why not? And the answer might be, well, there's no submission seeking them, and you can tell me that. Have a, I'll get back in my box. I'm used to that. <laughs> uh, but there's a on a philosophical question. Mm. Like we've had a lot of submissions talking about the need for it, intensification of existing areas to, to take note of some of these sort of things. Mm. I think maybe maybe the the relationship between UFD 02 and 07 could be uh, looked at there, which is along similar sort of lines. Um, but UFD 07 applies to all development rather than just uh, greenfield, which is identified by the plan. And one, yeah. UFD 01 uh, through you two. Um, is about compact urban form is within the majority of urban development located within the city centre in and around centres and along major public transport corridors. So that connects at least three and four of UFD02 to their um, intensification. Yeah, it's uh, to the extent that Yes, I accept there are overlaps. It's sort of like a, a gap analysis. Yeah, that that I think is required. So uh, to my, I've written down: Do these considerations apply in brownfield areas? The answer is not three, and but we're not four and five already in UF uh, UFD01. So the that just leaves three of them for you to think about. Mm. whether that's in seven or whether then there's a question of scope to sh shift around anyway. Mm. Um, mm. The I had a question about the reasoning in one one seven seven. Um, those bottom lines clearly have to go in the plan somewhere. 
is the choice to put them in the plan as a strategic objective something that is susceptible to submission like you said well uh, they're beyond the scope of the submission yes the, the content but is the fact that you put them in as a strategic objective rather than a note jammed into the residential section for instance choice of where they fit in the structure is that subject is that potentially subject to submission because that's um, mm, that's a good point i'll just have a look at the mps it probably doesn't tell us exactly where in the structure of the plan it needs to go i think it just says must just put it in the plan mm, from recollection agrees yeah that's correct And, and if they are susceptible to submission, what's your opinion? <laughs> is there an alternative location they could be better placed or is the strategic objective the best place for them to appear in your view? Look for an answer now is that right a reply well if you've got one now that's fine but if you want to think yeah. about it, that's fine too um i'll come back to you on that one and my last question on ufd relates to one nine uh, 1190 where possible I'm aware that there is a decision related to a transpower line in Tauranga that interpreted a plan that said where possible that said where it is physically possible irrespective of cost now is that what you mean Uh, no, that's that was the one where the uh, uh, line went uh, went very close to over the top of the Marae, and uh, High Court interpreted. I think it was the NZCPS. Mm. So as I say, is that so that uh, that particular objective uh, in my rebuttal? That's one where I've considered Mr. Heels advice and I've agreed with them um, that that one could be changed um, to reflect the contribution that character precincts can make to accommodating growth um, while being responsive to their streetscape values. <coughs> I've removed the term where possible. Thanks for pointing that out to me. Uh, Do you give me a page number? Oh, that's for in relation to. Yep. Uh, it's in uh, Appendix One. Um, appendix One. Page. Uh, or... Yeah, that's probably the easiest place to see it. Just to see what the end result is. <coughs> or uh, page eight, sorry, as well. Oh, I'll read. Yes, I, I got you. Thank you for pointing that out. I had nothing else on UFD. Anything else on UFD? Yeah, just one. Uh, UFD 03, the note or the qualification that's been added at the UFD 03. Mr. Hill was pretty strident the other day. I know you know you went here in, in person, but do you hear what he had to say in relation to UFD03? Because he, he wants that completely removed. Mm. He wants UFD03 just to be as it is with, without any clarification about qualifying matters. Do you, 
with my view on yep. what, he, what he had to say at the time. Yep, so I've been following online, um, listening to all the submissions. Um, and I, I understand um, Mr. Hill's view, um, but I also recognise, um, as was put forward by Transpower, that there's a period of uncertainty um, as to what are the qualifiers for the MPSUD and for um, the MDRS. And I thought that I agreed with Transpower that adding um, this note um, where the qualifying matter areas term would be um, hyperlinked would be a way of um, increasing that clarity for plan users. Right. So you, you're still pretty keen to make sure that something is in that strategic objective. That is, it's not just one, two and three. There might be some other stuff you're going to have to take into account as well. That is. I, I have some sympathy for the view of Transpower that when you at first glance without getting into the detail of the plan as to how rules and standards work with one another, it is a bit un uncertain and this was a way of um, communicating that um, there were some, uh, in some areas that medium and high density development would be dialed back as it were. Transpower of course have sought a definition of qualifying matter areas. Could we head off that by turning it round? May not be appropriate in areas the subject of qualifying matters. <laughs> that, could, that, that would do. <laughs> and Mr McCutcheon, were you, were you intending to refer to all qualifying matter areas there or were you thinking of particular ones like character areas or where there was particular infrastructure restrictions. Um, so my recommendation for the definition of qualifying matter area had been to go back to what um, was contained within the Act and that sort of ripped straight from the MPSUD because um, I note that um, like in the, in the case of Transpower, they're drawing on the part of the definition that says uh, around nationally significant um, infrastructure. Yep. Um, and in the same way that um, you know, char character precincts are being justified under the other other qualifying matter and heritage is a ma matter of national yes. importance, rather than um, sort of listing them one by one, I had recommended going back to the broader RMA term um, because they each work in different ways. Like the uh, a designation might require you to get the consent of the uh, requiring authority, and that is the mechanism through which um, medium and high density development might be dialed back as opposed to rules and standards of the plan that limit building height and density. Okay. Okay, I asked that question pretty clumsily. Actually, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Um, with the note, with the with the addition in red at the bottom of UFD03, was that note meant to apply to all qualifying matters or selective qualifying matters? Um, so it would it would um, refer back to all qualifying matters as um, was contained in the in the definition I've put forward. But for some for some there will be an impact and some there won't. Um, and it's a little bit awkward how it's done in the RMA because you've got designations being listed as a qualifying matter. Yeah. Um, and if you take while one the the airspace one technically that's that's a qualifying yes. matter, but it might not be relevant for three quarters of the city depending on where that MDRS is being undertaken. And if the note says maybe mm -hmm. it's going to cover a multitude of sins. That's one way of looking at it. Yeah I'm reading may in relation the way it's written I'm reading may not be appropriate in qualifying matters per se. Mm. Another way of stipulating that might have been may not be appropriate in some or all. All qualifying matter yeah. areas yeah. I just don't know what the intention was. Um, yeah this You're saying it, that the intention was the letter. I think the word um, all could usefully be added to um, infer that in some qualifying matter areas it will be appropriate, but in others it won't. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Just, sorry, I've, I've still got. I'm going back to something I meant to ask before about UFD03 as well. And again, referring to Mr. Heal, um, 
it was pretty late in the afternoon. We didn't have the opportunity to ask Mr. Hill too many questions, which was unfortunate, but it is what it is. He was pretty strident that it should only it, you should take the medium out, um, and just relate it to high density. So for the reasons you've outlined, it doesn't matter whether it's medium or high density. If the qualif qualif and these these things still need to apply, and where qualifying matters are appropriate, they need to be taken into account. Um, I think Mr. Hill and I are coming from slightly different views, and and yes, it, it was late. It was six o'clock that you, that it finished up that session. Um, why I've suggested it still be medium and high density um, reflects that growth approach around centres and how we do use the medium density residential zone. And I would, in my view, um, the 14 metre development, uh, high development that is around centres isn't isn't a high density use. And on that basis, I consider that it should be medium and high density because in some other centres we do have the high density um, zone around it, uh, including the city centre within a walking catchment, um, which meets um, those those one, two and three criteria within the note. Um, so in short, because we do apply the medium density zone and the development of 14 metre high buildings, which I would consider to be medium and not high density, yeah. um, means that that state statement should remain. Um, the word medium, if you came to the view that we shouldn't use the medium density zone or not around um, these areas here, it could be removed in that case. Having said all of that, do you still think that that, that sentence adds a necessary clarification to the objective, given that there's some, we already talked about whether it's qualifying matters per se or some or all, um, your, your interpretation of what medium, the reference to medium um, relates to, um, someone else's definition, Mr Hill, uh, interpretation that it should only be high density, do, do you think if if that objective was sans that last sentence, would it be inappropriate? Would it? Sorry, do you mean the note that I've yeah. recommended? Yes. Um, look, I don't think it's the end of the world if it's not there. I, I had agreed with Transpower that it might be a useful okay. um, note to add for plan readers. Yes. Yeah. And was KO a further submitter to the Transpower Commission on um, that? Be here in my notes. You have to go through. Should know that. So, Kaying Aura wanted to remove the medium part as part of their original submission. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. That would have been a, as that would have been in the first line, presumably. Yep. Yes. yes. Correct. Yes. Can I just ask a sense check? Is it only qualifying matters that determine uh, inappropriateness to medium and high density? Uh, yeah, no, it's not. Um, so the amenity heat mapping, for example, um, that's the primary mechanism um, in which in that in the growth approach around centres, medium and high density developments being allocated. Um, but in the um, in the back blocks of, say, broad meadows, we don't apply the high density residential zone because it doesn't meet um, one, one, at least one, two, and three, and those other uh, enablers of growth growth through which the medium and high density zone has been applied. It's not the full picture, no. And Transpower's specific problem was that there's going to be a, a interregnum when this is going to be in force and the relevance of the provisions aren't. So mm -hmm. that's that's the core of their submission point that you've accepted, isn't it? Correct. So um, Transpower, as I understand it, are worried that the national grid provisions are going to get lost. Um, in this intermediary phase when um, the plan is notified and submissions are to be made on the IPI 
um, that the uh, national grid uh, yard provisions will be forgotten and they will get MDRS developments um, within that area where they would not otherwise be enabled. And to clarify, um, Kainga Ora did uh, oppose through a further submission TransPower's original submission point. Any more on U of D? Just, just one and amplify the stuff. Oh, seven. And it was a relatively minor point, but uh, if you've got your list of one to eight developments to be achieved uh, in respecting cities' historic heritage, lots of stuff. Leads to that effect. Just signal whether you had a view on that or whether we make things better. Or... That would be appropriate in my view. In that, yeah. Any more for any more? Any more on the section 42A report? Silence is gone. Uh, I'll accept that. I'll just make sure I just, well, just um, while you're doing that, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. McCutcheon, did you um, hear the Dati Tor submission earlier? You would have heard um, the response to the question uh, from uh, Ms. Octim Lewis about uh, Papakainga provisions. Uh, being um, considered covered in other matters. Um, it would be good to get a response to that as part of the um, reply as well. Doesn't have to be right now, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, in relation to your amended wording of um, uh, the UFD 08. Uh, would it be advisable to identify what sort of growth you're talking about, their role in accommodating growth? Is this residential growth? Is it industrial growth? Is it business growth? So I can clarify that. Is it an enlargement of SNAs? <laughs> I think something for you to think about. <coughs> oh, yes. Paragraph 58 of your reply. Is there a not missing? Are you saying it should be treated as a qualifying matter or are you saying it shouldn't? Um, I think yeah, first read, I think it is. Well, uh, this comes back to the um, situation I outlined before where the Act says here's a big long, long list of qualifying matters, but then it's does the quali do you use the qualifying matter in the plan to either engage policy four and reduce building height and density, or do you include other controls to manage it? And so what I was trying to say here was, I agree with Miss Grinlington Hancock that the entire national rail network falls within the definition of nationally regionally nationally significant infrastructure. And if we if if agreement is reached that um, provisions could be introduced to uh, manage the effect on that network, then it would be considered a qualifying matter. 
well, we would be we would be including provisions on the basis that it is a qualifying matter and we need to modify the MDRS or policy three um, to uh, ensure efficient operation of that network. Um, what my paragraph 59 says is that in the next um, hearing, that's when you will be provided with the advice on the um, whether, whether we should include provisions in the plan, recognising that it is uh, Eligible to be a qualifying matter, and we should include provisions on that basis. So what? Yeah. So so what I'm the sense I'm getting is what you're saying is you accept in principle it could be a qualifying matter, but it's yet to be proven that it is. Yeah, in, in effect, yes. In the same way that designations are a qualifying matter under the MPS, but we don't do anything specifically in the plan to recognise them as qualifying matters. And positive the last question. Um, the um, in relation to Mr. Grace's evidence for corrections, uh, your paragraph 65, the definition is drafted so that all residents would need to be under the supervision, care and assistance, etc., of another person. And so that's the definition of supportive residential care. Why is it all? It just says for residents. Uh, the Interpretation Act would say, say you read uh, plurals for singular and singulars for plural. I mean, a possible amendment could be to include the word all residents. So you, uh, well, I won't take that as gospel. Yeah, so think about that and um, uh, advise our your final position and reply, please. That's all I had. Any, any more for any more? Cancelled due to lack of interest. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a yeoman effort to both you and Mr. Wharton. Uh, now that we've worked through it, like it's a very comprehensive 42A report, and we've been assisted a lot by it. It's sort of highlighted a lot of issues, and I'm certainly evident from the uh, uh, submitters' evidence that they've used it and bounced off it. So well done, gentlemen. Thank you. So we will adjourn till 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, for the record, the uh, panel is planning to head to Johnsonville to, uh, to resume our strolling around the streets of Johnsonville Centre in the balance of the afternoon.